Well, good morning. My name is John Rogers. I'm an environmental manager with the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. We'd like to welcome you to our collaborative meeting. We appreciate this large turnout, and we think we have an excellent meeting plan today. Um, I first would like to recognize a few people that came here, and we appreciate their support. First of all, Representative Watkins, I saw you out there. Appreciate you and your support you give us. And Senator Winterton, I saw you earlier. There you are. Thank you. We appreciate you and what you do for us. Also, we have two of our board members from the Oil, Gas, and Mining, Alan Walker, there's Alan, and Gordon Moon. So appreciate your support in this meeting. Um, as we get started, I'm not going to say much because we've got a lot on tap today, but there's a few things I just want to show you because we... Um, we always wonder kind of where we're at. So this is where we're at production-wise with through April, okay? Uh, this is oil production, and you can see we had the COVID lows back there a couple of years ago, but look how we've climbed out of there. We're now trending above 3 million barrels a month, so that is, that is good news. The thing that's real interesting is, uh-oh, what did I do, Paul? Yeah. I got a new computer here I'm working with. There we go. I got it. <laughs> um, this is our gas production. Look what happened there. For several years, we were just declining at that standard rate, and now we've popped up, and we've almost flattened out, and we actually saw in production increasing, probably mostly due to associated gas and then the increased gas prices we're seeing. So um, back in this day, I was panicking back in, in the early COVID days. I thought that trend, that big dip there, I thought well, maybe this is the end of oil and gas. But as we all know, if you've lived out in the basin here or been in this industry for any period of time, it's certainly an up and down business. So we're tough when we get used to it, okay? Um, just some things about the division right now and where we're at. We have 220 APDs through, the first, through this time period. So half the year basically are at 220, so that's an increase. And we have 13 rigs running now. Back in the COVID lows, we actually were down to zero. So we've really rebounded quite nicely. And some things from um, on the legislative side. Last session, House Bill 244. Has anyone heard of that and know what that's about? Oh, some of you have. That's the carbon sequestration bill. And it allowed us as a division to uh, go ahead with rules and seek primacy from the EPA to do class six injection wells. Now class two is what we do with water, injection water. We have primacy from the EPA on, uh, EPA on that and also now we're seeking that. So that's a process we're starting now. The reason I mention that is there was a national conference here in Salt Lake just oh, a few weeks ago or a month ago for the GWPC, that's Groundwater Protection Council. And during that meeting, um, class six carbon sequestration was a big topic, as was what do we do with produced water and how to reuse produced water. We all know the drought, and th so those are two things that that organization is, is promoting and working towards. And the reason I mention that is because our first speaker is Dan Yates, is from that organization, and he's going to talk to us about our relationship and what he does for us as other states also in creating a friendly environmental production and interface for the oil and gas industry. So I'd like to turn some time over to John Baza, our division director, to introduce Dan, and then we'll go on with Dan's presentation. Good morning, everyone. It's really good to be back in Duchesne. We've uh, been running these quarterly collaborative meetings for many years now. In fact, on the drive out, I think uh, I was calculating back in 20 plus years of running this meeting. And it's interesting, when we first started, this was under a previous director, these were monthly meetings. And then after a while, we stabilized with some of the issues we're de dealing with and uh, we converted it to a quarterly meeting. But we, when Bart and I talked, we thought this was a great opportunity to maybe expand the agenda, uh, provide a meal, and you know, basically do a little more networking than we would normally do. And, and in light of networking, I want you to know that 
as John said, the Groundwater Protection Council, who the state of Utah is a member of, has been a great partner, a collaborative partner over the years. Um, the executive director, Dan Yates, is here today to talk about the Groundwater Protection Council, so I'm not gonna go into any detail about the organization. He'll talk about the business side of what we do. But the state of Utah, through the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, is a member of that group. Um, and there is a synergy that's gained when we work with them on things like database management, the issues that John talked about, class six injection, produced water, just tremendous work and benefit comes out of that relationship. But I wanted to introduce Dan because he's been working for the GWPC for 20 plus years. And I've known Dan for about half that amount of time, maybe 10 or 11 years, but um, he's become a good friend to me. And he was the associate executive director until last year when Mike Paik retired and Dan took over as the official executive director of the organization. So with that brief introduction, I, I want you to know he's a great guy. I've seen him and his family grow up and it's just, I'm just so pleased that he was able to come here from Oklahoma City and talk to you today. So Dan, I'll turn the time over to you. Before Dan gets started, I always forget to do this, and my uh, executive assistant always gets on my case, so we're going to get our, our role, pass it around. If you're on there, make that you're here. If you see people that have moved on to better places, cross them off, or if you want to add your name, certainly do that, and that gives us a, a more of a database to get this meeting out to people. So I'll start passing around. All yours, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, John and John, both. Uh, happy to be back here. This is my my second time to Duchesne, I was back here um, about four or five years ago for this meeting where we were talking about frac focus. And so I'm really happy to be back. Um, I, uh, just a little bit about myself uh, personally, just to kind of uh, set the scene. I grew up in the Oklahoma Panhandle. And interestingly enough, though the landscape is quite different, the Oklahoma Panhandle really isn't that much different than this area. We have agriculture, you know, raising cows, growing wheat. We have lots of oil and gas. I grew up in, in, the, in the oil field. And we've got a, a fiercely independent population base in the Panhandle of Oklahoma. So I feel right at home except for these, these things called mountains that I see. That's not what I'm used to uh, at all. Um, but, uh, you know, I grew up in an area where uh, farming practices and, and oil and gas kind of uh, all happened hand in hand and I had uh, family members in, in both industries and I hardly spent any time in any houses growing up that didn't have an oil painting of an oil derrick in them. So um, uh, as, uh, uh, as we were driving out here, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, 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 land rights and, uh, and uh, underground uh, mineral rights and the, and the severance of those and uh, how that can be some, sometimes surprising uh, to people who own land and don't know that they own the minerals. And I was just kind of shocked by that because I just grew up knowing that, you know, here is a, a pasture that you own, but you don't own, you know, what's underground. So um, uh, I've been, uh, like John said, in nonprofit association management for uh, about 22 years now. Um, I started when I was 10. Um, and uh, have been working uh, diligently for those, those 22 years, um, but uh, have really enjoyed it and am really happy uh, to now be Executive Director of the Groundwater Protection Council. Mostly today I'm going to talk about oil and gas data management and how we work with the state agencies, but first I want to give you just kind of a, uh, a big picture overview of who is the, the Groundwater Protection Council. So we're what's called an association, and many of you, you're, you're members of associations, I'm sure, so you understand um, what those are. Our association is a national association of state agencies. 
there's a lot of groups like us, both on the water side and for almost every other state agency you can think of. And so um, the Groundwater Protection Council is unique in this space because we have kind of a, a, a two-part membership. We've got the state oil and gas regulatory agencies, like the DNR, but then we've also got the state uh, DEQ, or env environmental agencies. And that's been true since our founding uh, almost 40 years ago. And the history of that is the UIC program, the Underground Injection Control Program. So as uh, uh, EPA started that the UIC program in the 70s, and states started to get primacy for UIC, often that primacy was split to two agencies, where in many states, uh, the oil and gas agency would get class two primacy, whereas the, the DEQ type agencies would get primacy for uh, class one, class three, which is solution mining, class five, which is kind of the, the, the umbrella group that all the, uh, the different um, uh, wells fall into. And so we were established, um, uh, like I said, about 40 years ago to be uh, an incubating space for underground injection control and how states were going to implement this federal program, and states already had UIC programs. It's not like the, the federal government said, now there is a UIC program, you guys have never heard of this. These programs existed. So as they came into compliance and got primacy from the federal government to implement those programs, GDPC has kind of created over time a space where we can pull in the state agencies, the federal agencies, industry of all the various uh, uh, UIC well classes to do shared learning right, to learn as we go and to make sure that the technological developments that are happening within the industry are being made known to the regulators so that we can keep the regulatory schemes uh, uh, up to date. Uh, one of the things that we really, really focus on uh, is a phrase we call cost-effective regulatory approach. Uh, I've been in this business for 20 years and I've yet to see a state agency that's been given, you know, billions of dollars to do everything that needs to be done exactly the way it needs to be done. We really focus on what can we do, the best job that we can do with the resources at hand, and how can we learn from one state to another, and how can we learn from industry to government and government to industry. So we're really about pulling in everybody to, to kind of focus on these topics, and again, how do we get the best bang for our buck? Where's the best place to spend our time and our energy both for conservation, for environmental protection, and for all the other things that, that state agencies do. Um, uh, again, we, we started with a, a real heavy focus on the UIC program, and then over the years, uh, that focus started to broaden out to groundwater protection at large. In fact, our original name was the Underground Injection Control Practices Council, and then about 10 years in, before my time, the group changed their name to the Groundwater Protection Council for this broader role. So I do a lot of work on oil and gas regulatory issues, but I also do a lot of work on source water protection, groundwater and, and wellhead protection. Like uh, uh, John mentioned, the Class 6 program is real high on our, our priority right now. It's the newest well class, and uh, states are starting to come on board to get Class 6 primacy from EPA, and we think there's going to be a a pretty strong uptick in in the use of class six wells. One of the things that we're another thing that we're really focusing on right now is the potential for pore space competition. We're talking about poking a lot of holes in the ground. We've got class two wells, oil and gas production wells, now class six geosequestration wells, geothermals on an uptick. And so how do we do all of these energy related activities, but still have enough pore space to, to do them all, both for the um, uh, uh, disposal as needed and for energy production. So I think that's going to be something that's going to be high on, on everybody's list. So the bulk of my talk today really is going to be about um, data management and how the Groundwater Protection Council works and interfaces with our state agency members to ensure that we're doing the best job we can, again, from a cost-effective regulatory approach, to have the data management tools that the states need to manage their program, but also to have the outward-facing tools for the public and for the industry, for e-commerce, for the availability of data. And I'm going to talk a little bit as I go through um, about how, what we're doing in Utah 
and how the Utah DNR really is a leader in this space for us. We're doing a lot of pilot projects here, and states are already starting to implement things that we've kind of homegrown here in Utah are getting kicked out to, to other states. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But this is just um, uh, a big picture overview of the, the many states that are involved with GWPC on uh, data management in one way or another. Uh, the RBMS uh, suite of tools, it started out as a, as a UIC and a well-centric program. And so the original idea was we need a good data management system to manage class two wells. And that, uh, again, that was before uh, I came on board with the organization, and that very quickly grew beyond UIC into production wells and the many other aspects of oil and gas regulation. And so what does RBDMS do? RBDMS focuses on the state mission critical responsibilities for managing a regulatory program. So you see kind of the laundry list here, um, which isn't a list of modules, but really just kind of a top level, electronic permitting, uh, drilling and completion oversight, production reporting, plugging and abandonment, and, uh, and several others. I'm going to talk about uh, each one of these a little bit, but the various tools within the uh, suites, there are internal-based tools that are really simple to simply tools for the uh, state employees to use to do their day-to-day -day operation. There's external-facing tools, both... Um, as I mentioned earlier, that, that business to government component, electronic reporting, getting, trying to move off of, of, of paper forms, that's been a big push uh, across the country. Um, the various reporting requirements that are, uh, that are needed. And then finally, uh, data visual, visualization tools, which is kind of a, the, the new frontier where we're doing a lot of work right now. Here's just some of the, of the products that are, that are within RBMS. Some of these are, are used uh, in Utah. The, the core really is just kind of that, that base level part of the system, the database that holds um, all this information. I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn. The main point of this slide is just to show you that um, it's not one system. Upload this or, you know, develop this whole thing, install it, and you're good to go. It's kind of a, it's a cafeteria plan for states. Uh, many states will, for example, already have a field inspection module that they built themselves, so they don't need RBMS field inspection, but maybe they need the UIC module or Data Explorer. And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a pick and choose your parts, and every state kind of picks and choose different parts. But the beauty of the program is that we're able to capitalize on federal investments and state investments to help all the states that are interested move quicker, move cheaper, not reinvent the wheel from the ground up, modify something from one state and, uh, and, and use it in another. Here's just another list of uh, uh, some of the uh, applications that we got, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, about the dashboard stuff uh, later. Electronic permitting is a, is a really big part of this, right? Um, uh, over the course of, of my career of 20 years, I've seen really a, a, just a real strong push to try to move off of paper forms and get us into the modern age. It is 2022, right? We, we do have iPhones and we've got computers and there's ways uh, to do this better and faster and have the flow of information back and forth. And so I know that uh, here in Utah, some of the electronic uh, uh, tools that they're using, including uh, uh, APDs, uh, directional reporting, and then uh, uh, production and injection. And so we've done some really, really key work here in Utah that we then can push out to other states like we're doing a, a really big project in Texas right now. And so a lot of the lessons learned that we do here in this state, we get to take to another state. We'll learn more there. We'll make some upgrade, and then that upgrade gets to come back to Utah for a much cheaper cost than each state going it alone and building kind of their own system. Hmm? All right. Yeah, you're welcome. Make sure the people at home can hear me. You guys can all hear me fine? 
So uh, part of, uh, just to digress for a minute, uh, part of my background, um, uh, I have a, a master's degree in public administration, which is kind of the the, the, the base for what I do at the Groundwater Protection Council, but my undergraduate degree is in music, uh, vocal performance. So uh, I usually do a pretty good job of projecting in a room, uh, but we want the anybody kind of joining remotely to be able to hear me as well. Um, and I, I'm happy to take questions. If you've got questions while I'm talking, uh, raise a hand. I'm happy to, to stop, or if we want to do questions at the end, that's fine. I'm very, very easy going about that. Um, and so, uh, Area of, re area of review is something that's really important to us from the UIC perspective. And so what we're working on with several states is building more visualization tools so that the state agencies can actually perform area of reviews and have the data from as many wells and facilities as possible as they make those determinations. So as you can see, there's uh, 3D well bore diagrams, um, uh, horizontal and, and lateral well diagrams. And again, we're just trying to help the state agencies make the best use of the data they already have, right? And so instead of locked in, a, in paper files or uh, data that gets submitted, that gets reviewed um, uh, years later, it's what, can we, what do we already have and what do we have at our, at our, at our fingertips to do this work? Data Explorer is our, our public facing tool. It's used, uh, I guess, really, it's, it's used in two ways. Um, the state agency employees themselves can use Data Explorer uh, to answer uh, new questions, to respond to uh, legislative and, 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 and questions from the governor and, and that sort of thing to kind of really dig into the data. But then it can also be used as a public facing tool to both for industry to use that available data, but also for uh, the, just even the general public. The dashboards are something not, that I'm actually really excited about. And um, the staff at UT, Utah DNR were very, very instrumental in the early stages of us developing what we're now calling the dashboards. Because as you can imagine, state agencies of, of every kind are inundated with all different kinds of data. Permit data, um, uh, public request data, um, and, and many things. And so, that's in there, it's in the database. But what we've seen over years past is that if you get some sort of special request or uh, your leadership asking a question, it can take quite a while to kind of dig in to the database and try to answer those questions yourself. Maybe you need an IT person to do that instead of a program person. And so what we've been doing with the dashboards is building these easier to use kind of visually based tools where we can plug in some standard reports, the things that you wanna know uh, monthly, daily, weekly, uh, but also the ability to run um, uh, individual reports, kind of one-offs. And so again, it's a way for us to help the states make use of the data they already have, but just make it a little bit more user-friendly. This, uh, uh, this wellbore application, um, is another good one to help visualize um, a well bore, uh, compare a uh, proposed well bore to, to an actual, uh, understand the, the, you know, the location, surface casing, and those kinds of things. And it provides uh, a 3D graphical representation of both the vertical and the, and the directional drilling. Uh, so it's been really useful to a lot of states. So, you know, we're really proud of the work that we've done over, over 20 years. We've helped our state members, these uh, oil and gas agencies, move from um, paper reporting and paper files and things that get shoved to archives in five years that you may or may not ever be able to have access to, to actually, again, kind of making that data work. And one of the one of the newer uh, tools, and I hope everybody in this room has this downloaded. If you don't, you should do it today. Mm -hmm. So we developed a app called WellFinder. You can find it in the Google Play Store or in the iPhone App Store. Uh, search for RBDMS WellFinder right here at the top. And it is powered by state data. So we're not going out and, and, and mining data somewhere and trying to pull this all together. This is an actual data flow specifically from each state and the Utah data is in there. 
oil wells, gas wells, UIC wells, and others. It's got what I call header data. So it's really just kind of the top level data. Where's the well located? I can find it on the map and I can drive to it. Who owns it? What type of well is it? And so it's not, um, uh, you can't do a lot of high tech analysis with this tool, but if you drive by a well, you can quickly look it up on your iPhone and know four or five things about that well. And so um, we've been developing this app for uh, about four or five years and the life cycle of, of iPhone apps um, is, is pretty interesting. You've gotta really be developing and redeveloping those all the time to kind of keep them up to date. So we've had a couple of, of new features recently, including a drive to the well. Uh, and so we're finding that Field inspectors are now using the iPhone app to help them uh, find their wells. Um, if you uh, hired uh, somebody new to be to go out and check your own wells, it could be a tool that they could use uh, to figure out, hey, how how do I get from A to B? Is this on the other side of the gulch? Do I got to go around? Um, and so I would encourage everybody to download WellFinder and to know that uh, again, Utah DNR has been a huge partner with us to allow this, uh, this iPhone app to be really, really super useful. Um, last I checked, I think we've got about 14 states that, are, that have data in WellFinder and we're working with five or six other states to get their data in there as well. I know that there's not a ton of seismic activity in, in Utah, but the seismic app is always a fun one for me to talk about. And it was kind of the beginnings of our dashboard style uh, applications for, uh, for, for UIC and, and other types of wells. And so in Oklahoma, uh, originally, kind of that's the, 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 was the ground zero for seismic activity, we've got a lot of oil and gas production, we've got a lot of injection wells, and starting around 2013, we started having a lot of earthquakes. I grew up in Oklahoma. We're not used to that. Tornadoes all day. We know how to handle tornadoes, right? Um, run outside and, and look in the sky and see what's happening. That's how we handle tornadoes in Oklahoma. Earthquakes were, were, were a new thing to us, right? And so um, uh, we didn't know what was happening. We had a lot of different ideas about it, what it was. Um, and uh, really, it was, the, it was the uptick in the amount of produced water going down hole in injection wells in various locations. And so the Oklahoma Corporation Commission needed to very quickly get on top of this. Shutting down oil and gas production in the state of Oklahoma, not an option, right? A huge part of our economy. But allowing earthquakes on a daily, weekly basis, also not an option. And so they were running a pretty complex analysis to help them determine how to give orders out to the industry on limits for volumes and pressures. And so um, uh, it was a very labor intensive operation. It would take them like two or three staff members working together for two or three days to get to a point where they were confident to say, okay, well A has to limit its pressure and volume of produced water to this amount per day or, or, or per week. And so they asked us, because of our, our, our experience developing these RBMS tools to come in and help design a tool that would be kind of a quick response tool for them. And so we built this seismic application. And so the blue dots that you see are injection wells, the red dots are earthquakes. We pulled in the injection well data from uh, the Corporation Commission itself for the what they call the, uh, uh, the area of interest in Oklahoma, uh, what I colloquially call where the earthquakes were happening. That's the area of interest. That's why we're interested in it. Um, and so we pulled all of the UIC data for that area. So not the entire state, but the area of, the area of interest. Um, in the area of interest, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission made a decision instead for injection reporting instead of monthly reports submitted yearly, they started requiring weekly or daily reports submitted weekly, right? To give them a more granular amount of information. Because again, we want to slow down the earthquakes. We want, we want to be able to keep injecting because we can't produce if there's nowhere for that produced water to go. And so um, we pulled in uh, earthquake data from the USGS and from the Oklahoma Geologic Survey and gave them the ability to kind of toggle back and forth. 
and then we built it kind of in a, in a modular fashion. So you can see in the top right is the map view. This is all the same data. The top left is the earthquake grid that just gives in the list of earthquakes. Question over here. They uh, they ranged in sizes, and so there were a ton of twos and threes, like twos and threes all the time. Yeah, but there were some fours and fives as well. Yeah. So you're going to get me out of my depth really fast. Let me mention, that's okay. I'll happy to answer the question, but let me, I didn't give my disclaimer at the beginning of this. I'm not a geologist. I'm not an engineer. I am not an attorney. I'm a social scientist. If, <laughs> if I'm a scientist at all, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a people person. I'm hundred percent soft skills. Right. Um, and so I think uh, that's a question that's a little bit out of my depth, but I'll, I'll try to address it. There's a lot of different types of geology in Oklahoma, and so it's it what from a layperson's perspective, it wasn't always like the injection well is here and the earthquake is here. So I know this injection well caused this earthquake. There's um, a lot of complex geology where this injection over here and a mile away, we've got an earthquake over here, and we think those are related because of something going on down hole. So that's about the best I can do with my uh, music education background to answer, <laughs> answer your question. But, that's, but again, that's part of why it was, it, it was complicated for the Corporation Commission to figure out. But what we were able to do, and this is kind of my, the fun take home from this slide, is we took their two or three person, two or three day process, and we built them this app to give them all the data they needed at hand so that one person could do it in five minutes, right? And imagine how much better you are at being responsive to citizens and to state legislators and the governor when you can take a, a three-day process and turn it into a five-minute process. So it was, a, it was a really, really, really big win for us. Um, I set a timer at 24 minutes, so I know I've got just a couple more minutes left uh, with you all. And again, I'm glad to take questions. Glad to talk to you at the, uh, at the breaks as well. But I wanted to just kind of quickly point out a few additional things. The Groundwater Protection Council also runs the Frac Focus website. So if your company does hydraulic fracturing and you're reporting your chemical use to Frac Focus, that's also us. So I just like to kind of remind people, some people I think sometimes think Frac Focus is its own organization. No, it's a, it's a, a product and a project that, that, that we operate. WaterStar is one of our newer tools, and so because we've been doing all this good data management work in for the oil and gas agencies, like the good work we've been doing here in Utah for so long, we're starting to get the attention of the members of the Groundwater Protection Council that are on the water quality side for the water quality agencies. And so WaterStar is our product that we're using all the lessons we've learned over 20 years, and we're starting to build modules that help manage water quality. And so in Nebraska, we're helping them manage uh, nutrient plumes and so they can uh, have a, a dashboard equivalent of the seismic app and see where nutrients uh, are and where the high risk areas are across their state. In New Mexico, we're helping the New Mexico Produce Water Consortium manage produce water volumes and so they can do a better job of, uh, you know, they've got a, a huge drought going on there so they can do a better job both inside the oil and gas industry buying and selling water and knowing where water is available and how to get it, how it moved, and also looking at the potential of produced water outside. And so WaterStar uh, is a, a really fun program because it can pull data from multiple different places, even multiple agencies. It doesn't have to own the data. It can just kind of suck it in, and then it gives somebody much more and powerful uh, decision-making ability. Um, and so then quickly, I wanted to touch on what I think is one of the most exciting things that we're doing, and we're doing it right here in Utah, is the priority application. And so, um, like I said earlier, looking at cost-effective regulatory approaches, how do state agencies decide where to use their resources to the best of their ability to focus on what they need to focus on, and how do we prioritize those things? So we've been working with Utah to build priority modules, and there's there's several. So inspection facilities. How do we prioritize 
what kind of data do we need and how can we analyze that to make sure that we are inspecting the facilities that we need to at the right intervals with the right frequencies and what are the uh, um, uh, issues that might exist that would cause something to be needed to be inspected more often. Is it in a source water protection area? Is it near a school's drinking water supply? These, you know, those kinds of things. What's great about the inspection, the prioritization work we're doing is that each state agency that implements our prioritization tool, they decide on their own criteria. We don't care about the criteria. We care about building a data management structure that allows the states to set their own criteria and then kind of, again, utilize that data they've already got uh, and get it out. And so um, uh, Utah, again, is doing it kind of in several key places. Incident priority, and then I think the next one here is uh, uh, idle well and, and orphan well. Uh, there's a huge focus uh, on uh, orphan well plugging uh, right now and on idle wells. And so, again, what data do this, does the state already have to help them prioritize? And how do we use uh, a software tool to do some of that work for them? work smarter, not harder, right? Don't put two or three people working two or three days on something that a piece of software can do for you in five minutes, give you the same answer, right? So that's what we're doing here. Um, I'm really, really excited to be uh, working with Utah. Um, uh, really one of our lead agencies, like John mentioned, John's been on the board for a long time and, and, and John and I have gotten really close. I know several of the other staff here. And um, I think the important takeaway for all of you the thing that maybe that you that you don't know is how much good attention Utah is getting from other states on a national level and how we're incubating software developments at the state level for small amounts of money, but working smarter and not harder. And then states like Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and even California are saying, hey, I want the thing that you all developed in Utah because that's better than what what we've got. And so I think that's kind of my, my take home for all of you is if you, if you didn't know that Utah is a national leader in data management for state agencies, they are. And we're really, really excited to have uh, Utah as a member of the organization and have them really, really focused in on RBDMS. And I hope that you will talk to the staff here uh, while you're here about um, how these tools are, are helping them and we hope this is a long-term partnership between Groundwater Protection Council and Utah DNR to, con to continue to push out these new tools and to continue to address new and exciting things. So as Class 6 becomes a reality, and assuming that, that the DNR goes after primacy at some point, well, we're going to be right there waiting with training opportunities that we're, again, working with multiple states on, with uh, data management opportunities for Class 6, uh, helping states interface with EPA. That's a big uh, role that we, uh, that we do is pulling multiple states in together and interfacing with the EPA on what the state's needs are and how we manage these programs and what our options are, keeping a lot of tools in the tool bag. Um, so again, um, my name is Dan Yates. I'm the executive director of the Groundwater Protection Council. We're a national association of state agencies. We're involved in all manners of water quality in all manners of state oil and gas regulations. And we do that by pulling together the community of people who are knowledgeable about these issues. We don't go hide in our bunker and pretend like we're the experts. We pull in industry, we pull in um, other associations, environmental groups, state agencies. We're all focused on kind of the same thing. How can we all work together to come up with uh, solutions, and I feel like we've been uh, uh, pretty successful. So thanks for having me today. Take yeah, I'm happy to take questions, absolutely. Not all at once, not all at once. One at a time, please. Alan. Hey, Dan, I, I didn't notice this before, but when you, oh, when you uh, put up your maps of the folks that are in uh, RBDMS and mm -hmm. risk-based data, data management system, and GWPC, there's a discrepancy there. There's a lot more people in your RBDMS than there is in GWPC. What, what's going on there? That's a, Oh, yeah, let me, I didn't do a good job of explaining that first map. Thank you for asking this question. 
this is our board of directors map, and it's not it's not highlighted there, so that's that's confusing. So this is not a list of members, but it's a list of where our current board members and what states they're they're coming from. So yeah, you if you put all three of those maps together, then almost the entire. Uh, 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 map is, is highlighted. So not every state participates in, in GDPC, but the majority of states do. And in some states, we get more participation from the oil and gas agency, and for some states, it's more from the from the DEQ. We also pull in the geologic surveys. They're not official members of the organization, but they're another one of those third-party groups that we can't do this work without, right? A lot of good scientists, a lot of good information coming from the geologic surveys and, and other groups. Dan, this is John. Hey, John. Hey, um, you talked a lot about the, the value and benefit of the data systems that states are using. And a lot of that is kind of non-quantifiable. It's more qualitative. I know you mentioned about saving staff time on various analyses and things. I'm kind of curious. A lot of states have invested tremendous dollars in the data systems. Uh, and I use, for example, California and Texas have thrown huge amounts of money at this. But can you give us an idea on the input side where the dollars come from for some of these developments in the various states? So um, several different places, right? And so we've been very fortunate for um, about 14 years now to continue to see, receive a, a grant from the Department of Energy. And uh, the, that money actually comes from Congress, right? And so uh, we've got a line item in the, in the congressional budget under the DOE's budget for RBDMS and related activities. It's not a ton of money, but it provides really good kind of seed funds so that we can go out to a pilot state and develop a beta version of something. Um, and so that's part of the, of the money. We've gotten some private investment here. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund has been one of our funders in the past. Um, they're only interested in kind of certain areas, so we've worked with them on a couple of, of specific things. Uh, but then the bulk of the money really does come from the states, right? And as you mentioned, um, California put in about $60 million uh, to completely overhaul their entire system. They were still on, this is going back about five or six years ago, they were still on paper forms, you know? It's the middle of the uh, of the 2010s, and we're having and we're doing paper form. So we really did a, a big ground up. But the the nice thing about the 60 million dollars spent in California is that then we were able to take all the lessons learned and some of the software from that and push it out to other states. And uh, another important aspect of this is we don't charge for the software. We're not Microsoft. It's not give us your uh, your $500 a month um, subscription fee, the states really only pay for the implementation costs. So we take a module from one state, we bring it to the other state. How does it need to be changed and updated to fit this regulatory structure? Even the nomenclature is different. You know, what's called an APD in one state is called something else in another state. So there's a field you have to change. So those are the complicated factors. But again, we're saving each state a ton of money by saying, here's a product that maybe meets 50% of your needs. So how do we pull together the resources to get it to meet 100% of your needs? Does that answer your question, John? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks thank again. You. Yeah, we really appreciate being here, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I just wanted to add something. About 10 years ago, we were, our old RBDMS system was dying, and we had an internal system, too, that we were using. So the two didn't really work together. And so we sat down and we thought, well, we got to move in a new direction. So there's a little bit of pressure to do this internally with our own uh, Division of Technology Services. And we started down that road, and we'd sit down with these programmers, and we'd say APD. Now, what is that? A wellbore. Explain that to me. Um, API number. They didn't really understand the industry. So we started down and we said, this is not going to work. So we decided to go fully with RBDMS, with the Groundwater Protection Council. And we found out something that was being done in Arkansas or Oklahoma could easily be transferred over to us. And so we got these great systems 
at a cost that was just minimal compared to what we would have done if we'd all done this internally. And in the end, we got a better system anyway. So we appreciate what they do, and it really enhances what the division does in keeping um, what we do in inspecting, permitting, and um, completing wells. So anyway, thank you again, Dan. Okay. Um, Reed, could I see you come in? There you are. We're next going to move on to, uh, let me get my notes here. Reed Page is with Summit Energy, and his title, if I get this wrong, you let me know, Director of Marketing for Summit Energy, and he's going to talk about the Uwinna Basin takeaway for gas. Gas is becoming more and more complex, and I think the more we understand about it, uh, the better we can, you know, maximize our resources out here. So I'll turn the time over to Reed. Let me get your... There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, John. Sorry, I was just a minute late. Little rain, little construction, but we made it in one piece. Um, huh, pleasure to be here. Uh, back out here in Duchesne. Uh, it's been a minute, I guess, since. Uh, oh no, we were here recently at Starvation with our families over the, over the last holiday. So uh, I say we. My twin brother is also here. Some of you might be aware of him. We're clearly twins. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad oh, there's some animation going on in here. Okay, uh, first of all, Summit Energy, uh, yes, I'm director of uh, gas marketing operations and business development to a degree unofficially, um, but we're Rockies focused natural gas marketing and trade. We're, uh, as far as I know, the only uh, gas marketer uh, of our type that's headquartered right here in Utah um, in downtown Salt Lake City, and we're the largest third-party seller of nat gas to uh, commercial and industrial customers throughout the state. We got over 750 meters, meter locations, uh, mostly on uh, on DEU, on Dominion Energy Utah, formerly Questar, uh, Questar Gas Company, um, as well as a few towns. I think, let's see, I have Blanding, uh, Hilldale, uh, some uh, City of Nephi. Um, we do, uh, that's, that's our, our end use marketing side. I'm more over the, the producer services and marketing and trade um, where we complete the full circle from, burn, from wellhead to burner tip. And uh, so I interact a lot more with the producers and uh, handling you know, risk management, pricing, um, forward analysis uh, to help them out with investment decisions. Uh, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, Mostly, uh, mostly right here to feed our uh, our Wasatch Front customer base in Utah, Colorado, Wyoming. We're pretty focused on small and medium-sized producers. Um, once you get to a certain size, it makes more sense to have an in-house trader uh, or in scheduling team. Uh, so we're transporting primarily on Mountain West Pipeline, formerly uh, Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline, until the more recent acquisition. Um, which actually Mike Molinar, who's here, so I'm kind of in the hot seat. I've got the Mountain West guys here, so I can't say anything bad about them today, as much as I'd like to. Uh, these, uh, so Jack and, and Mike are here. They're really, really great, actually. Um, so we, we transport, uh, we have a lot of transportation experience on Mountain West Pipeline, but also Kern River Gas Transmission, which takes gas, the bulk of the gas from southwestern Wyoming, all the way down through Utah and uh, into Vegas and then Southern California. Northwest Pipeline, which goes from Four Corners, San Juan area, all the way up to the Canadian border at Sumas, uh, but, but uh, supplies a lot of gas to the Pacific Northwest. Colorado Interstate Gas, El Paso Natural Gas, which is a southwestern uh, pipeline running east-west from uh, the Permian Basin all the way into SoCal. We also have storage capacity at Clay Basin, just up here, uh, not too far away from us. And uh, we use that as an as a operational asset, primarily and uh, make some seasonal arbitrage by buying low in the shoulder months, hopefully, and selling a little higher in the winter months. So that's a brief of summer. Oh, and me, I'm, I'm from uh, Roosevelt, Neola. Uh, we grew up uh, first 12 years uh, in Roosevelt, just uh, across the field from Constitution Park, and then uh, moved up to Neola after her dad built a house up there. And uh, so we're, we're locals. I'm a local. And uh, I went to Utah State. 
studied econ finance and I've been with Summit pretty much since I got out of school. Uh, I also have a welding certificate from UB Tech. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I got my, uh, my CDL there too, so, um, which I never ended up using. I, it, it elapsed. Eh. It's not getting me out of any speeding tickets anymore. So um, anyway, oh, quick plug for UPA. The last lunch and learn that I was able to attend was so great that uh, if you missed it, then you should request from Ricky who's here or, or um, request the, the link because it was really, really great. And I would strongly encourage anyone in here who doesn't follow these uh, to, to please follow them. Take a look. Um, if you're not a member of UPA, consider membership. And uh, ah, you're welcome, Ricky. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, this one was so great, and I had to rewatch it. And I probably need to rewatch it again to take some notes. But their analysis on a macro and micro level of, of how the UNA Basin is affected by global oil pricing was so dang good that uh, I just I wish I could be one of them. Alas, I'm not. Um, so here is now into the, to the bulk of this. I have. Uh, allotted 30 minutes for myself, but this is, this is the Dominion, uh, it's going to be really tough for me to go around, guys. I'm going to keep calling it Dominion, but Mountain West, Mountain West pipeline map, um, and it shows sort of the shape of it. It's, it's the, the sideways H, however you want to look at it, but, um, and since we have two different screens, it's a little tough for me to, maybe you guys, yeah, you guys can see the, the pointer. Okay, so here's, here's us, here's Duchesne County, Uinta County. Gas tends to flow, uh, the physical flow is west over here to uh, the Goshen Interconnect over to Kern River Gas Transmission. You have these little triangles which are uh, compressor stations and uh, that's commonly where you have constraints. The compressors get full and you can't move any more gas. Um, this is mainline 80. Uh, so you have, you have two different things. You have capacity and you have subscribed firm transmission. So how, how much firm, uh, has been already sold to somebody. So, so who has first claim to the space on that pipeline during any given time? Um, but this, this, this pipeline's pretty much fully subscribed. Um, it's pretty well called for, for the most part. There's some turn back capacity that's gonna be coming in, coming back uh, to get gas out of where we are to those sweet markets with the best premiums. Is, it could become a challenge uh, here in the future as uh, our production continues to grow, particularly out of uh, Central Basin here um, and the Mighton Yard, which we'll look at a little more closely. Um, Mountain West guys, you can call me out if ever I say something wrong, but I'm going to try and be as vague as possible so I can be uh, as, as, as little wrong as possible while still being useful. But the, the places where uh, if you're going to sell wholesale for gas out of the Uinta Basin, the value is into, generally is into Kern River, Kern River gas transmission, as well as into the city gate, which is where all of my customers are. These are... These are your city gate entry points um, where the gas comes off of the FERC regulated interstate pipeline. Mountain West is FERC regulated, um, which comes with its uh, list of challenges, regulatory and policy wise. Um, so the, the best price for your gas is get it to the interconnect at Kern down here at Goshen or up here. It's a little cut off at Roberson, Roberson Pass. And, or sell to the customer base here along the Wasatch Front. This customer base is limited, and obviously there's seasonality to this whole thing. Um, our burns fall off quite a bit in the shoulder months, obviously spring and fall, pick up a little bit in the summer with cooling demand, uh, but are, are the highest in the winter. So this is the places that the gas wants to get to where it can fetch its best value. Well. Let's see if uh, let's see if I put the, I, I put a, a box around around here because we're gonna there's another map that kind of focuses on it. This is Kern River gas transmission. It's a little grainy, but this is this is the big Kern pipeline that takes gas from like I said southwestern Wyoming, um, Quest Our Mighty Creek. There's an interconnect up here uh, at Roberson, and it takes uh, gas down another another entry point into the Salt Lake City market into uh, Dominion Energy Utah the utility or the local distribution company, but also the, the bulk of it then just continues on down to California. Um, and again, that's, that's, where the, that's where they're paying like $12, I think, right now on the day uh, because of cooling demand. So uh, spot prices down there are really high, while uh, here we're probably still in the mid-sixes. So there's a big price spread between, you know, between these production areas and uh, the, the heavy demand areas. 
So there's a lot of there's a lot of detail in here. We can I have all of my maps. I'll put them out on a table probably after this, and we can talk about them. But here's the zoomed in of the where the red box was. There's your red box. So I decided to zoom in here. Uh, this is again compliments of uh, the marketing team over at Mountain West Pipeline uh, because there's a little bit more detail here. This is uh, this is the real point of concern right now. Um, and more recently, there have been some constraints on these. And I pulled these numbers. This is showing total scheduled quantity. Over, uh, divided by uh, operationally available capacity. And uh, JL46, 97% utilized. JL47, 99% utilized. And uh, where JL47 meets 138, uh, down here, 99% utilized. So not a whole lot of space left to move gas out of uh, the focus area for drilling right now. What XCL and Finley and everyone is really chasing down in here. Uh, if you bring on too much gas, you're gonna start running into constraints. If you can't move your gas, going to be hard to move your oil because we're not going to be routinely flaring 3,000 decatherms a day. Um, light up the whole, the whole county. Um, yeah. There are, I guess, let's see, what do I have in here? Okay. Here's another, another view of the actual, these are the segment capacities. This was as of, for today's flows, it was yesterday's timely cycle for scheduling. Um, we notify the pipe what, what the intentions are for flows a day ahead uh, noon the prior day. So I pulled this yesterday afternoon so I could see the actuals and you can see all these different segments and this is where I got my numbers. It tells you what's the operationally available capacity that can be scheduled. Well, there's 2,000 decatherms for that for, for today. Uh, things might have changed now that we're actually within the gas day so maybe it's tighter or maybe it's looser. Um, but it's hard to move around there. 811 decatherms. Suffice to say, it's, we're pretty well, we're, we're pretty tight. Goshen, zero, zero decatherms of operationally available capacity to get more gas through the gauntlet of, there's some compressors over there. Uh, Oak Spring compressors probably constraining today. Um, Goshen, definitely constrained. It is at zero. We have zero left. So our ability to get the gas from where it's coming out of the ground to where we would prefer to sell it, it's, it's, there's not a whole lot of space left. So we're left uh, with some questions. Well, where can we move the gas? Can we move any more incremental capacity out of this area specifically? Because we're already, we're pretty much full. We're pretty much full right here on these laterals that are heading south and carry uh, the gas from Aldemont Bluebell and all of the receipt points within this little area and move the gas east over to the Fiddler area where Chapita plant is. Chapita plant uh, has a lot of capacity, a lot of available capacity. They have three frack trains. I'm not sure on the total nameplate capacity, whether it's 760,000 a day or it's 950,000 or somewhere in there. At any rate, uh, they're only using a couple hundred thousand, I think, right now. So there's a lot of space over at that plant. The problem is the plant's all the way over here to the east and the gas itself is all the way over here to the west. And it's gonna be really tough just to, to get to get it there. So of course there are some planned, uh, some proposed um, fixes. There was an original proposal from Mountain West, a uh, 30,000 decatherm expansion uh, to improve the situation right down here. However, that is on hold as far as I know right now for uh, regulatory uh, reasons, I guess is the best I can say. Um, not a whole, I, I don't know the details on why that was on hold, but it was, it was originally proposed back in the spring, I think in March during the last customer meeting, the annual customer meeting, but since has been put on hold and the plug has been pulled on that for just a minute. Um, so we're left with uh, options that as far as I know are proposals that a couple of companies are working on. The largest, uh, I'd say gatherer up in this area. Uh, I'll let, uh, I'm hoping that Desi Sharpton from, from Kinder Morgan can, can come back and add some color to this to this idea, but there is a proposal to move gas, to build a pipeline and move gas all the way over uh, to the east to get it to where the processing capacity is. Um, I believe that, that proposal would bring a ton of relief, uh, 50,000 to 100,000 decatherms a day of, of relief, depending on how it's sized, the early capacity in phase one compression. Um, timeline, don't know. I think the, the hope still, fingers are crossed for like Q1 of next year, but considering how hard it is to get stuff done right now and the costs that we're dealing with out there are just insane, completely nuts. So I don't know how it's all gonna shape up. I know that Finley is also 
working on uh, potentially trying to move their gas from west to east as well, uh, try and tie into maybe Three Rivers Gathering and take it all the way into Iron Horse Stagecoach Chapita. Um, so since I can't talk too much about those specific uh, midstream projects, because I just I don't have the details, and they're pretty, it's, they're pretty new, pretty early uh, in the conversations, I think, or at least I am on the Kinder Morgan side. I'm really crossing my fingers that they can get done in a reasonable time frame, hopefully as soon as possible, so that drilling does not have to slow down. Um, but assume that we get some of that done. And now the takeaway capacity from this specific area has been resolved to a degree. Now we've got all of our gas over to the east. The big question is what, what happens after we get it to the east? And let's see if, oh yeah, these are, these are point capacities. There are a lot of points still, receipt points, where the, the gas can be delivered from the production area and delivered into the pipeline. There, each, the points are generally pretty uh, oversized. Um, so there's plenty of space in the individual receipt points for all these production areas. However, it's, it's just the segments that carry it away from there. Headed south and then over to the east. Oh, natural buttes versus uh, some of the other fields here in Duchesne County. Well, there's a lot of this natural buttes gas it gets, gets processed at Chapita. So there's some space now. There's a lot, there's, there's relatively new space just because of the decline of the natural abuse field. Um, we're starting to see some upticks and we will continue to see additional upticks in, um, in gas production. We're going to take a look at the Mountain West commonly constrained locations. This is just to, again to illustrate. This is last year, Goshen, 138 days constrained. I think that was mostly during the winter when gas is trying its hardest to move from, from the production area to the high demand areas when gas is, you know, when there's a $15 spread or $8 spread to be made. So it constrains. Uh, there's constraints all over the place. So it's very clear uh, Mountain West is a little bit tapped. This is just Q1, January through March. Again, Goshen constrained 31 days out of 90. Um, out of Mighton, 13 days uh, constrained. We've got a few more, uh, more recently. Aldemont itself constrained 35 days. Fiddler. This is a, a really rough constraint point because you've got a lot of gas east of Fiddler and it wants to flow past, but Fiddler tends to just be full. So last year, 177 days out of the year, roughly uh, half the year. Um, again, there were probably, I think there have been other uh, proposals for some, some compressor uh, upgrades that would help move gas past Fiddler, but if you can't move it into Goshen, then what's the point? You're just squeezing the balloon. Okay. Um, Coming out of the Chapita plant, this is CIG. This is Colorado Interstate Gas. So Anna Buttes is the, the tailgate delivery point into Colorado Interstate Gas. This becomes our, our other options. Now we're going to look at the two or three other options. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, if you can get your gas over to Chapita um, Iron Horse Stagecoach, your gas will absolutely move. You will abs we can move your gas. Your gas can move. There is space and takeaway capacity uh, after that. Price-wise, might take a haircut. Because you might, have to, you're going to be selling gas into a slightly less valuable market, um, with a little bit more expensive transport to get for a marketer to pick it up at the tailgate of Chapita and move it on down to who knows Weld County, wherever, wherever they want to take it. Um, but the gas will move. So now we're, we, it's always been sort of a question of flow assurance versus price optimization. Let's get the best price we possibly can. If you're always going to chase the best price, you're going to be taking pro, um, flow risk. And so it kind of depends. Where's your revenue? Where's the focus? Let's just keep this oil flowing. Well, we need flow assurance for the natural gas. And so just be prepared to take a little bit of a haircut. In a $6 gas environment, you know, you could probably afford 40 cents in transport. Um, you're going to have to, probably. Um, or, or a discount so that the market that buys it from you can then transport it away to a, to a market where it can find a home. But we're looking at Anabutes here, operational, operational capacity, uh, 183,000. Total schedule quantity, 25,000. So not very much leaving the tailgate of Chapita plant to go into CIG. For obvious reasons, the gas is worth a little less there. So there's probably some commitments. Um, the remaining gas, the, I don't know, 175,000 or whatever, that's probably flowing into Dominion, it's fetching a slightly better price. So water flows downhill and gas flows to the best price. Um, the segment that carries it away, 112, there's about 18, 19,000 decatherms of available capacity right now. That doesn't say anything about firm transport commitments. Uh, I did speak to the CIG pipeline rep uh, yesterday or the day before. 
He says there's lots of capacity available, firm transport away from this. So not a concern, would be very easy for me to trade it out and get that gas sold. See uh, Kinder Morgan's other pipeline. So Kinder Morgan owns CIG, also owns WIC, Wyoming Interstate Gas. There is another lateral that goes straight north um, out of the tailgate of Chapita, and that point is called Golden Dome. Uh, these are details that maybe you just don't ever want to remember, but um, I'll remember them for you guys. Uh, operational capacity, 1,161,000 decatherms. There's a lot of space. Uh, total schedule quantity, 61,000. So probably adjust my numbers. There's still a chunk of gas flowing out and into WIC, but there's a lot of space. There's a lot of space on WIC. You can get your gas out. You got to get it to this area. Now, I haven't mentioned Stagecoach and Iron Horse, which are also over here. That's, uh, those are marathon facilities. They have uh, an interconnect with North, uh, Williams Northwest Pipeline where there is also space, but again, you're going to be going, you're gonna be discounted because flowing north where it wants to go, it tends to constrain like half the time. Rangeley compressor, Green River compressor, sometimes Vernal compressor, really, really tough. So we might have to flow it south, take it to San Juan, and maybe San Juan's more valuable. At the moment, it's flipped, and it's more valuable, but it's a kind of a rare occurrence. So um, alternatives to from Chapita, your Anna Buttes into CIG, Golden Dome into WIC, and you can also T-port backhaul to uh, White River Hub, which uh, we didn't really, I didn't go into detail on, but you can take that gas, flow it with Dominion, or, with, Dominion with Mountain West Pipeline, and uh, you can take it in reverse through uh, the Fiddler Compressor Station backwards over to White River Hub, where you have multiple interconnects with other pipelines, and you should be able to get your gas to move. Again, you're gonna transport it just to get it sold. So, another discount. Right, so this is just the reality of uh, getting the gas out of a relatively constrained area. Um, so it's the Uinta Basin Permian, you know, uh, a couple of years ago when we saw negative day pricing down in the Permian Basin. I don't think we'll, we'll get to that point. Hopefully, holy cow, I really hope not. But uh, so fingers crossed for some of these projects and also fingers crossed for Mountain West and uh, some miraculous change in, uh, in the wind out there that will make it easier for some of these uh, the federally regulated pipelines to get some of these expansion projects done. Um, we're all hoping for that. So um, let's see where we're at. Oh, random thing uh, that I, we're, I'm actually working on is a uh, CNG engines uh, for crude haulers. Um, this has nothing to do with anything that I just talked about, but um, but the uh, Cummins do, uh, does have a 15 liter now. It'll have 500 horsepower. You'll be able to spec it out and haul supers. And uh, ultra low NOx, no def, no catalytic converter, um, and uh, $3 fuel, right? $2.70 fuel instead of what you're paying right now or what our, our transporters are paying right now. So this is a reality uh, that's, I think, coming down the pipe in about a year and a half. So there's a lot of preparation in terms of infrastructure, and I'm hoping that we can take uh, some of this constrained natural gas um, out of the exact place that I had my red square around and we can run it into the trucks so that we're not sending oil to the refineries, bringing diesel back, and just doing the weird little circle. We can use our, our resource that is already here much more economically and uh, with a dramatic improvement to air quality. Yeah, for NOx and uh, ozone precursors. So it's an important thing. Um, all right, well, uh, oh, the, uh, that's it. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of details, like, and you don't want the details. I'm telling you that right now. Um, but if you have questions, uh, talk to me afterwards. Um, we can talk about any of this stuff and a bunch of other crazy stuff. You know, whatever. Um, I'm committed, right? Summit's committed. Our company, um, Integrated Energies, energy companies are committed uh, through our crude, crude marketing and trade operation, uh, Pinnacle Energy Marketing as well. And Peak Well Service, which is a sort of a fixture out of Roosevelt too, is one of my sister sister companies. Um, so I'm long term committed. Like I said, I'm from here, and um, the success of everyone in this room is is uh, is my success, is everyone's success, and all the people that I care for still here. Um, so I look forward to hearing from all of you. If there are any questions, I don't know if there's time, John. Does anyone have any? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. John. Um, I didn't set my timer, so I don't know how far we've gone. Oh, I got a question for you. Oh, man, okay. Um, a few years ago, 
There was talk of a uh, LNG plant in uh, Coos Bay that didn't come through. Yeah. Now there's talk of well, there's one in Ensenada, Mexico. Mm-hmm. Now the idea was to take this gas and get it down there and send it to Asia, but if the constraints here, how were they planning on getting it there? Um, I had a lot of I, I participated in a lot of those conversations with Andrew Browning and um, Western states and tribal nations and. Um, I don't. I don't know. I I tried to explain to them this issue. Um, also, uh, like, it doesn't have to. You don't have to say the molecules are from the Uinta Basin in order for that project to benefit the Rockies, mm-hmm. because the rising tide r- lifts all boats, you know. And so, if you were to provide, and, and that project's still moving forward, um, the Sempra project, right? And I think it'll be about half a BCF a day. Um, they do have some pipeline to build to get it from the uh, El Paso South Main Line down there or maybe TW, Um, but half a BCF is quite a bit of gas. And that provides an additional relief valve for Permian gas, which generally crosses that Southern main line. And the less Permian gas we're competing for markets, we are competing with for the same markets, the better off everyone is in the West. Mm -hmm. And, And so like, it doesn't have to say on paper, chain of custody, this molecule came from the Bluebell gas processing facility, you know, or Chapita. Uh, All that matters is that we're, our gas is finding new markets. All this Western gas is finding new markets. And how much that would lift us here? Like, it could be a dime. It could be a quarter. I, I don't know. We won't know until that natural experiment plays out. Right? But oh, we should, I mean, I'm very, very supportive of that, of that project. I really hope it, I hope it happens. I really do. It would be very, very good for, for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Uh, any others? Oh, they've been wowed. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Our next presentation will be tag team between Commissioner... Um, Greg Miles from Duchesne and um, Keith Heaton, who is the executive director of the Seddon County Infrastructure Coalition, and give us the insight to the railway and see where that's going to head us economically. So I'll turn the time over to Commissioner Miles first. Okay. There you go. There's your clicker. Thank you. We need the wrong is that the wrong one? Yeah. Oh, I sorry. Probably should be wearing my glasses. <laughs> you and me both. Okay, you're the Did that it take away? Oh there you are. Okay. It's awfully small. Sorry. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. And as John mentioned, I'm Commissioner Miles with Duchesne County and also one of the co-chairs for the Seven County Infrastructure Coalition. And uh, my fellow co-chair, Casey Hopes, Commissioner Hopes from Carbon County is here today, and Director Keith Heaton, who took Mike McKee's place. And we also have someone from our private partner, Kyle Robe, uh, from Rio Grande Pacific. So we're, and Pam Giuliano, I just noticed, was in the back too. So. Um, grateful to be with you. Um, you know, it seems like a decade has passed since the early 2019 quarter. Um, there's been a lot that's happened. And um, in early 2019 is when the wheels really got into this project again. And, and you know, that not to minimize all the work that happened before uh, 2019 in order to get this, this project going. Um, I can't think of another project that's happened in the state of Utah that has had, and maybe, you know, hard pressed to find another in the nation that has had 100% political support uh, from the county commissioners in both Duchesne and Uinta County, the seven uh, commissioners that sit on the the seven county infrastructure coalition board, um, President Adams, Speaker Wilson, Senator Winterton, Christine Watkins, Scott Chu, um, Governor Cox, the entire federal delegation, and the Ute tribe. 
And, you know, to have that kind of support for a project, uh, that's, that's how we've been able to have success. And I, I uh, appreciate all those who have been involved. And I, I can dare say that without all of that support, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. I, I get questions all the time since the project has really kicked off. You know, those who are speculative or skeptics, what's, what's the possibility of this getting done, really? And I've said from the very beginning, very likely. And today, I would tell you, baby, it's coming. Um, and it's, it's been hard fought. I, I don't want to minimize that. We've had a lot of hurdles to overcome. Uh, we've had some major challenges. We um, have been involved in three lawsuits. Two of those have been settled. In fact, uh, last week, or was it this week? Anyway, um, last week uh, we did prevail in the challenge of the use of the CIB money uh, for planning purposes. So. Another, hold, another hurdle falls down, and, and we're looking towards the prize. So as Reed mentioned, there are some concerns, and we have a rough road ahead of us. We're not naive to the challenges that this is going to create, uh, both with road infrastructure and with gas constraints. With more production comes more gas, and we have to find a market that we can get it to. And whether it's, you know, a lawsuit that gets us somewhere in Coos Bay or Guaymas or Ensenada, who knows? But we have to find another market for our gas. Um, and I, I don't want to take away from Keith's presentation, so I'm going to keep my comments brief. I'll turn it over to Keith, and then we're going to let Kyle Robe run cleanup for us both. So, And I just want to, before I sit down, I want to mention um, Mike McKee was a champion of this project. And he invested a lot of time, personal political capital. I appreciate him. The hard work that he put into this project and many others. I, I won't continue mentioning names because there's been so many who have been instrumental in the success that we've seen. And uh, we are excited with Keith Heaton. Uh, he comes with a, a great background in community development, having worked for the state for many years and worked on many development projects, so we're excited to have him as our new director. And with that, Keith, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, again, my name is Keith Heaton. It's good to be with you again. Um, worked with many of you, been attended this meeting several times in uh, former positions with the state of Utah, so it's good to be here in this capacity. Uh, appreciate Commissioner Miles, Commissioner Hopes as well. Uh, for all that they do and for the great introduction. Uh, when you get an introduction like that, I think the best thing is you say, any questions? <laughs> um, it, it's always difficult to, to present, uh, especially to a distinguished group like this. Um, and, and I think the best play is to just go to the lowest common denominator, which is assuming that there's someone in the room that doesn't know anything about this. Uh, and again, the majority of you probably know more than I do. <laughs> so. Uh, I'll go through it quickly uh, so as not to bore anyone. Um, you know, I always like to say is if you can't be intriguing and exciting, at least be brief. So we'll try to go through it quickly. Uh, a little bit about the Seven County Infrastructure Coalition. Uh, it was a brainchild of the former Community Impact Board Chairman and the Commissioner of the Utah Department of Transportation. Um, they got the idea that, you know what, someone really needs to uh, address some of these larger projects and planning for these larger projects. Uh, and it's not something that, that local uh, influencers can really deal with. Uh, and wouldn't it be great if we had such an organization? And now we do. Uh, and, and we've uh, made some huge strides. We'll go through those things really quickly and then talk a little bit about the railroad. So our member counties are Carbon, Daggett, Duchesne, Emory, San Juan, Sevier, and Uinta. Uh, I think those look uh, a bluish green, aqua blue color on the screen there. Um, you'll, you'll see there's some holes and uh, we're always uh, 
looking to expand a little bit. Um, again, our co-chairs are Commissioner Miles and Commissioner Hopes, both of which are here. Appreciate their tremendous leadership uh, and passion. Uh, we also have Commissioner Ogden, uh, Commissioner Lytle, Horrock, Sidrud, and Gray Eyes. Um, and then uh, our partners are listed there. Our, our mission really is about quality of life. Um, I have a profound love for the people of rural Utah. Uh, and maybe people throughout the world in rural places are like this, but there's a genuineness, uh, a love of place um, that you don't find in urban areas and a commitment to building community. And so that's, that's what we try to represent. Uh, and again, as I said, looking at, at regional projects that impact everyone, uh, and the railroad is a tremendous example of that. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, one of our partners address us last week, and you know, he said, this isn't something that's gonna change the Uinta Basin. It's not something that's gonna change the state of Utah. This is something that, that has a global impact. Uh, Utah has some of the best products in the world, especially here in the Uinta Basin and in Eastern Utah in general. Uh, and the problem we've always had is we can't get our products to market. Uh, and if we could, it really does change the world. Uh, you look at what's happening uh, with Russia and the Ukraine, you look at what's happening in Asia and all of Europe uh, and any third world country, they're clamoring for the type of products that we, 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 we're sitting on here. Uh, but the problem is, as we've heard, is we, we can't get them out in an economical way. So if we can solve that constraint, it really does change the world. And so that's what we're, we're striving to do. Um, to talk a little bit about this rail project, this isn't a new idea. Uh, <laughs> you know, 150 years ago they were talking about uh, putting rail out here and, and it just has never happened for one reason or another. Um, so it quickly became uh, a focal point of the Seven County Infrastructure Coalition to, to, to dig up what we could about this project and see if, if we could make it happen. Uh, and we started with the Utah Department of Transportation study, uh, looked at that. Uh, and saw that, hey, this, this thing really, really is viable. Uh, we went to the Community Impact Board uh, and were able to secure a significant amount of funding, uh, just shy of $30 million, uh, to do the planning, uh, get the environmental permitting, uh, and those types of things done. As Commissioner Miles mentioned, we are thrilled uh, that we prevailed just this last week in, in a lawsuit against some special interest with, um, some special interest groups that didn't feel like it was an appropriate use uh, of impact funding um, and that things had not been done appropriately. Uh, I, I think the judge was very clear in that it was most appropriate and done most appropriately, uh, which was a, a huge victory uh, for this project and similar projects. So we're very appreciative of the impact board um, and again, the, the leadership of the state of Utah and the citizens of the state of Utah for recognizing the need for a project like this and supporting it. Um, I'd also be very remiss if I didn't echo the comments that were made about our partnerships. Um, this project would not happen. There, there's just no if and but about it without the Ute tribe um, and, and their commitment and their passion to see this done. They've been valuable partners. One thing that, that the Infrastructure Coalition strives to do is do things that traditional government can't do. Uh, and there are certain things that, that the government just shouldn't do. Um, and there are things that the private sector traditionally is not willing to do. Um, and the railroad is a great example of that. Um, it just didn't quite pencil out for any one industry leader. Um, and it certainly didn't pencil out for any one government. But when you break down you know, those silos and you build those bridges, it makes perfect sense for uh, a coalition of governments. And in case there was any question, I am working. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but when you, you bring together a coalition of governments uh, and you have the ability to work with the private sector, you have the ability to work with, with the tribal individuals, this is the type of thing that can happen, and this is, the, the, again, the beauty of this organization. Um, just some, some quick tidbits here. Um, the, the tax revenue alone is going to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and, and, you know, that just multiplies as time goes on. Uh, obviously, the job creation, uh, the economic broadening, 
Um, again, the demand for our resources in, in, in the world is, is phenomenal. Um, but, you know, the, the definition of a basin, I, I think, is <laughs> very resounding here, right? Where we've got all this stuff and it's kind of stuck in this bowl, and if we could, could get it out of the bowl, then, wow, what will we have? And, and I think one of the things that's held us back is you've probably all heard the analogy of, you know, you put a, put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, and as soon as one starts to get towards the lip, the others will <laughs> pull it back down, right? I'm not suggesting that we've done that, but so often that is what happens. And by working together as a coalition, I think we eliminate a lot of that. And I have been so impressed uh, with, with the board of directors of the Seven County Infrastructure Coalition, with, with all of the elected officials and the leadership um, in the Uinta Basin and these working together, putting aside their personal and, and, and their community's needs for a greater good um, is really impressed me. And it's one of the reasons I decided to pursue this opportunity is because you just don't see that. Um, you look at our nation, you look at our world, and everybody's with the attitude of what's in it for me. And, and when that's the only thing you see, it, you're like those crabs in a bucket, and things no one, no one really succeeds the way they could. And, and what we do in Utah, and I, I, I've always admired Governor Herbert for talking about the Utah way. You know, if, if you ever paid attention, he was always talking about the Utah way, and you still hear that a lot. Well, what does that mean? It means we work together. Well, we, we put aside what our differences are, we find common ground, and we move forward together to, to make a big impact. And again, so grateful for, for the Ute tribe, for working uh, with us to get this done. Um, and, and it's just, again, it takes everyone working together and it's, it's just a beautiful thing. I'm sorry I get, I get excited about it. Um, as we looked at the railroad, most of you know that we, we had to look at a lot of different options. Um, and last time we probably presented to you, you saw a map similar to this. Uh, and these were all of the different options <laughs> that we looked at to get product out of the basin on rail. This is the route that, that was determined uh, most feasible, uh, which is really good because it's the most direct, it's wholly within the state of Utah, um, and we call it the Whitmore Park route. And you can see uh, it goes through the basin, uh, up Indian Canyon, basically following High 191, um, just above Helper, uh, up to Emma Park will be where the, uh, uh, the terminus is there. So if you look at the red line here on the map, uh, that's the rail line. Uh, this is a heat map, which uh, I, I pulled up the uh, Wells uh, application. Um, and there was a heat map there, and it's pretty much the same one. So um, this, this is where, you know, the oil and gas product is, uh, specifically gas, in the, or uh, oil in this case. Um, and so you can see the rail line pretty much touches all of those. Um, so it'll be far easier to get product onto this rail line uh, to get it out to market. Um, looking a little bit at our timeline, uh, as Commissioner Miles said, uh, it's been three years. Uh, we were right on schedule, uh, which is very amazing because everyone said it would take at least two to three times as long as it did. Uh, and again, credit goes to, to all of those in this room that have helped with this. and. Uh, Executive Director Mike McKee, who worked tirelessly to get it to this point. Um, so things were great. Uh, we get to the, the darker blue there, the uh, fall 2021. Uh, we got Surface Transportation Board approval. Uh, all of our permits were in place. Uh, the only thing that was remaining was a Forest Service permit, uh, and things bogged down uh, for whatever reason. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, and it, it's been about six months. Uh, where nothing is moving. Well, a couple of weeks ago, uh, again, thanks to many in this room and in particular our, our partners at the Ute Tribe, um, we were able to get movement. Uh, Washington actually sent it back to the local field office here uh, for final notification to objectors and a few technical tweaks, and we expect uh, a rod um, uh, any day now. Um, to, to move it forward. So we're really excited about that. Uh, it's always difficult to, to stand up publicly, uh, especially when there's a Zoom and you don't know who's actually listening out there, um, to make prognostication about when, 
but we're we're fairly confident at this point that next year uh, we're going to see construction on this project, uh, which again is an amazing, amazing accomplishment uh, given the nature uh, of building a, a long distance freight line like this. I mean, it hasn't been done in you know 50, 100 years. I mean, it just it doesn't happen. So it's it, it's a big deal for us. So um, if you go down the list of all the things we accomplished, you'll see we get to the forest service permit. And again, that's just, uh, we're, we're fairly confident that's just days away. Uh, all indicators are that we're, we're finally getting there. So um, again, so grateful to, to all of our partners and to each of you, uh, especially the Ute tribe. Um, the coalition uh, did all of the initial planning and, and environmental processes on this. Um, to again, that's something that government is, is very good at and the private sector not so good at. Um, actually, building and operating a railroad, probably not something that the government is particularly good at, especially if it's not a commuter railroad, right? Um, so uh, we reached out and uh, through a procurement process selected Drexel Hamilton Infrastructure Partners um, as um, and, and reached an agreement with them uh, that we will sell um, our basically intellectual property, uh, all of our plans, the permits, rights, and everything to Drexel Hamilton. Drexel Hamilton has selected Rio Grande Pacific to be the operator uh, and, and builder of the railroad. Um, and Rio Grande Pacific, who is here, um, is, is working on procuring contractors, they've already selected a general, um, and they're moving it forward. So a lot of exciting things. So with, with that, I think the best thing is to turn it over to our, our private sector partner, uh, Kyle Robe from Rio Grande Pacific, and he can uh, give you a quick update, and then we'd love to answer questions. I'm gonna try to do this as seamlessly as possible, sorry. Um, let's see if that pops up. All right, here we go. Great. All right, that works. Um, in these pictures, uh, these were done uh, for the EIS, the final EIS, and uh, we thought these would be good to show everyone kind of a visualization of what the railroad could potentially look like. Um, this is uh, in Indian Canyon, uh, along 191, the uh, existing, and then what the railroad could potentially look like. Um, The next slide, again, we're uh, in Indian Canyon, and uh, this is the railroad here, the embankment, compared to the existing. Uh, and I've got a couple more pictures to show you. This one is at the top of Indian Canyon. Uh, this would be the portal for the three mile tunnel. Um, this is what it looks like today. This is what it could potentially look like with the portal um, going through a three mile long tunnel um, to avoid uh, the summit there. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a typical at grade crossing uh, for um, a non paved road. Um, our railroad, if it goes uh, across a paved road, it will be grade separated. Um, on non-paved roads, more local roads, uh, that's potentially what it could look like. And then uh, this picture just shows um, the railroad going up through uh, the Whitmore Park area. And so this is what it looks like today, and then this is 
potentially what a railroad would look like going up through the Whitmore Park area. We thought these would be good to, to share just to kind of visualize what, what the railroad could look like. And then uh, this one, this is a little bit harder to see, but this is what it looks like today. And then the railroad's way out here. It's a little bit fuzzy, but um, that's what it could look like. So uh, I'll get into uh, the construction process. Um, we certainly are very happy to uh, be a partner in this project. Uh, we certainly appreciate that partnership. Um, Drexel Hamilton Infrastructure Partners, they're working on the financial agreement shipper contracts. Um, you know, certainly uh, Rio Grande Pacific, we're looking at right of way acquisition. Um, we speak with landowners on a daily basis. Um, they reach out to us, we give them status updates and uh, things with, uh, with the private owners uh, are continuing to move forward. Um, the final engineering design, we're really excited. Uh, that's kind of where I uh, really like to get involved um, as an engineer myself. Um, the final engineering design, that will get started once we uh, get that last um, forest service permit. Um, the contractor and materials procurement, uh, we have made, um, like Keith said, we have made some progress there. So we've selected a uh, joint venture of Skanska and WW Clyde uh, as the general contractor. And then on the tunneling, there's five and a half miles of tunneling that's going to have to be done for the project. For the tunneling, uh, we've selected a team, a design build team of Obayashi and Briarly uh, to do that work. Um, and on the engineering side, we've selected AECOM to help with the railroad engineering piece. Now, um, I mentioned all of these names, these contractor names, um, but that doesn't mean other people won't be involved. So let me clarify, what does that mean? Um, we have committed to uh, use all of the local contractors that want to be involved um, to be involved on this project. So we've we talked to local contractors. Um, I, I met with one yesterday. Um, so we're certainly going to have them involved as well on this project. Um, this is a, a very large project, uh, complex, uh, very railroad specific. Um, and so we do have the capability and the, the um, expertise that we need to build the project, but we also wanna have local, as much local uh, work um, as possible. Um, construction start January 2023, that's our goal. Operation January 2025. I will just say this, uh, the longer that the Forest Service permit is delayed, that does push back our timing a little bit. So why is that? Well, I have to do geotechnical investigation on this railroad. I can't build it without understanding what I'm building on top of. And because of that, um, every month that I lose right now, because it's the good time to go out and do that investigation, if it gets pushed back into the winter, I lose two months on the other end. So um, every month I lose right now to be able to do geotech is two months delay on the other end because I have to go through the winter time. So with that said, um, we've, we've been working uh, hard to get to this point um, and uh, certainly we've We've gone a long way. Um, we've got a lot more to do still, um, but certainly feel very confident that um, we have a good team and a great partnership that we can get this done. So uh, with that, um, Keith, and I don't have anything else. Let's just do a question. All right. Questions? We did a good job. <laughs> I like that. Yes. Yeah, it's just one moment. Just one moment. Oh, hey. If you wouldn't mind just taking a minute describing the um, the work, I still have um, old westerns images of railway workers. So, what are you looking for in terms of labor and, and materials? I'll take that one. Um, so. 
This railroad is uh, going to be a modern f freight railroad, something that um, like a Union Pacific or a BNSF would build. Um, so in terms of labor, um, through the construction process, we'll be building embankment. Uh, so that's modern equipment such as, you know, front end loaders, dozers, uh, scrapers, uh, excavators. Um, and a lot of those, uh, the, um, the graders will have GPS on them, so they just enter all of the uh, engineering data into these uh, models, and then they put it into the equipment, and it just goes and it grades it exactly how you need it to be uh, leveled out. Um, so there's a lot less surveying that goes into the construction because it's already built into the GPS uh, model. Um, so you know we st we need skilled operators still um, of the equipment. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, there's the track construction, so that includes uh, ballast. Uh, the ballast rock that goes into that needs to be a, a specific strength uh, and type. So uh, typically we like to use granite for that. Um, the ties, which is hard to get around here, but um, we're, we're trying our best. Um, and then the, the railroad ties, they can be wood or um, concrete. Uh, the rail is steel, uh, what, continuously welded rail. And the reason I say that is because we will need welding um, specialty for this project. Uh, we also have uh, about 50 bridges to build for the project. So that requires um, skilled labor and welding experience for the bridges and crane operators as well. Um, the rail itself is a 136 pound rail, so it's a heavy duty rail, uh, typical in uh, modern freight rail construction. And then um, we also have um, um, the, the tunneling that we have to do. And the tunneling, um, we could do uh, multiple different ways. Uh, we could use a tunnel boring machine, which is that big kind of circular machine. Uh, that cuts through the rock. And the great thing about a tunnel boring machine is um, it, it goes pretty quick. Uh, they can get through that three miles, uh, that long tunnel that we have pretty quickly. Um, but if that doesn't work, then we'll use road headers. The challenge with road headers is if you get into some uh, very strong rock, then you have to pull the road header out, um, blast the face of the hard rock, and then pull the road header back in, and that can delay the project. So there's ups and downs between using different methods. But the challenge with a tunnel boring machine is actually getting the tunnel boring machine. Um, they're hard to find, and they're uh, very costly. But um, we're, we're looking at the benefits of each of those. So thank you for the question. Any others? Um, you might have to dance around this one, but uh, getting commercial, uh, how, I know this is, a, this is I've asked uh, Mark this a few times, but at this point, how, uh, how many, how, how much commitment do you need um, to get shovels in the ground in terms of, uh, of capacity? Or do you have, or, or how close are we to that? Because um, my assumption is if you're going to get shovels in the ground Q1 of next year that you're very confident in in hitting that commercialization level. <laughs> well, whether it's 80K well, that, or 130K. That, um, our, our partner, Drexel Hamilton Infrastructure Partners, would be the person to, to ask for the, that question specifically, but I'll let Keith here. Does this one work? OK, no feedback. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is a question for Drexel Hamilton. Um, and part of the issue of the reluctance to answering it is there is ongoing litigation. Uh, talked about the resolution of the case here locally with the CIB, but there's also a case pending uh, with the Surface Transportation Board and their approval. Um, I can say that uh, we are making tremendous progress. Um, I'm sure everyone's very aware of the situation. I mentioned it uh, with Russia and the Ukraine and what's going on in, in Europe and Asia. Um, the demand for product is, is astronomical. It's very unstable. Uh, the sooner we can get that out, the better. Um, and so um, there is a lot of commercial and industrial uh, interest 
in, in, in this. And um, uh, I, for one, really don't have any concerns about the way that's progressing. So again, with the lawsuit, don't, don't want to say too much, but um, it, we're, we're looking really good for that. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. One more question. I've, I've been to some of these presentations quite a few times, and I've asked this question twice, um, and I've been shrugged off mostly. Uh, we're in non-attainment. What's your, what's your plans for if we double production to make this profitable? What's your plans for the air quality issues and non-attainment? Do you have any clues on that one, being the engineer? <laughs> or are we going to shrug them off? <laughs> I, I don't have an answer to that, and I hate, I hate to shrug you off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like three years in a row. I know my dad mentioned that we were getting better. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll have to think about that. I, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions still. You know, one, one thing, we've met with the governor's office several times, and, and uh, we, when we were facing moderate non-attainment, our thoughts were, you know, this this doesn't all make sense. In 2018, when there was a downturn in production and and we capped a lot of wells, we P and A'd a lot of wells in the Uinta Basin, and we had rising amounts of ozone. Well, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. So I think with uh, USU, uh, the Bingham Research Center continuing to work. Um, I think there's some questions or some answers that will still come, and we will still continue um, to say that this is a weather-related issue. Uh, I surmise there's always been an ozone problem in the basin because when there's snow on the ground, uh, ozone is created. So we're going to continue to work on it and and push where we can. So that's that's probably all the information I've got for you. Thank you. Let's give these gentlemen a hand. Why don't we take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish up with our final portion of the meeting. We're going to hear from three of our producers from out here in the basin. Uh, Finley Resources, Javelin Energy Partners, and Oventive. And they've been three of our great producers and a major part of what we do out here. And so we thought we'd have a little introduction about what they do and who they are. And then we're going to have a panel discussion, which is uh, going to be moderated by uh, Gordon Moon from our board. And then we'll open it up some some questions. So we'll turn it over to Brent Talbot. He's the president of Finley Energy. It works. Good. Hi, I'm Brent Talbot with Finley Resources. I'm, uh, I'm president of Finley Resources uh, uh, from South Louisiana, full-blooded Cajun. Uh, been in the business for 42 years. And so that my, my, my young group of employees over here, they, they think I'm a dinosaur, and, and they've actually put a picture of me at the museum over there and, but like <laughs> next to the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And so uh, been here, been doing this a long time. 14 years ago, Jim Finley and I uh, stepped foot in this basin. We were actually um, looking at a handful of wells we had bought out at Leland Bench. Uh, we bid on a package that El Paso had out there, and it, it had some East Texas properties, uh, some Wyoming properties, and some Utah properties. At that time, we had some experience in the Rockies, but not much. Um, so we went out to location. It was February. 2008, it was five below zero, it was snowing. And I don't know if any of y'all been to Louisiana, it doesn't get that cold. And uh, so we, I just thought to myself, Jim, there's plenty of oil in warm places. What are we doing here? You know, what, what are we doing here? That, that changed quickly. Um, we, uh, we started looking at the, the geology. I'm, I'm an engineer, but I love geology. And, and I, uh, I said, this, this, is, 
This reminds me of the Wolfberry in the Midland Basin. Stack pays, just huge section of stack pays, uh, stuff, uh, formations that were very productive, uh, just waiting for uh, somebody to exploit them. Uh, the, the, the basin was very underdeveloped at the time. So uh, we watched as Ute Energy started developing their acreage position. Uh, we watched uh, Newfield uh, start expanding in what we call the donut hole in the center of the basin. And then uh, we saw Axia's success on the eastern side of the basin. So we started, it, along with our tribal partners, we started a program at Leland Bench, which was a tribal acreage. And uh, we, uh, we started a successful drilling program there. And then we started buying acreage out east. Uh, we leased organically. Uh, we bought uh, BBC's acreage on the east side of the field, uh, their, their production. And then we bought a section, a, a, a block of production from QEP. And so we were, um, we were, we were excited about the results we were getting, but uh, the, something interesting happened. All these people were drilling and having a lot of success, and we exceeded the market in Salt Lake City. Uh, so the refineries in Salt Lake City were having trouble uh, digesting all our oil, our wax, I should say. And uh, so we, um, we saw the first, I guess, boundary to grow into production growing production. So uh, Jim at that time said, we've got to learn more about our product and we've got to find other markets. So we, we, we had some very extensive assays done on our oil and we hired the, the leading consultant. The, the, this consultant firm in Houston models refineries all over the world. They also model different products that come into those markets, different crudes and how they, how they impact the refinery and what comes out on the other end diesel, jet fuel, kerosene, uh, wax, uh, a, a lot of good stuff. And so um, they, they modeled uh, the, the wax. And you know, for years, the refiners have just told us, man, this is bad stuff. It's, it's hard. It turns into a solid at 109 degrees. You need to, you need to discount it. Um, well, what, what these consultants told us, this is the best oil we've ever seen. We've never seen a wax like this. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is a world-class hydrocarbon. It's low in acids. It's low in metals. It's low in asphalt taints. And more importantly, it's low in sulfur. So th this is the only crude that I'm aware of that can go straight into a cat cracker. I don't know if anybody would want to do that, but it can. It doesn't have to go through a distillation unit because it is actually a pure hydrocarbon, as pure as they come. There's one other crude in the world you can compare it to is tapas. It, it, that's an Indonesian crude that's highly, highly valued because it makes great lube oils. And so um, armed with this, Jim went out and started, we got to fix this. So he, he went out and started trying to market this to, well, what kind of refineries would like this? And the consultants told us that refineries like the Motiva refinery in Port Arthur, big 630,000, largest refinery in North America, by the way. Uh, Exxon Mobil, uh, both in Port, uh, both in the Houston area and also in Baton Rouge. Uh, my dad built a lot of the equipment that went in the Baton Rouge refinery, so I was happy to hear that. Baton Rouge has a lube unit on the end of their their, their plant. This makes Mobile one for them. So uh, Jim was fighting those battles, and they they were hard battles to fight. It, it's hard to get refineries to change their crude slate because uh, I don't know is Big West here. They, they, I would ask Ed a question and make him talk. But uh, uh, it's hard because if you change one crude in your crude slate, it affects the rest of the refinery, all the other crude slates. So after a lot of hard work, uh, Jim was able to get some traction. So we, uh, we bought a rail facility down at Helper, and we started, we bought some, uh, loading equipment, uh, some transloaders. Uh, we bought some more. Um, and today, as I speak, we're transloading about 21,000 barrels a day at Helper, putting it on rail. It's going to uh, several different locations. But um, that story is the most important story in the basin right now. You heard from the rail people earlier. Getting wax out of this basin is the key. I'm going to fall. I know that happens all the time. Uh, so just real, real quick, that's our story. 
uh, we, um, we have 339,000 net acres between Finley Resources and Uwena Wax. Uh, we're producing about 30,000 barrels a day. Uh, we have uh, about 150 employees at, between uh, the two companies. We also have 20 employees at Wildcat Minstream, which is our rail terminal. We also have 20 employees at, at Wildcat Sand. Um, we have our own sand facility, and uh, we're using that in our frack operations. Um, we, um, let me change pages right, real quick. Today, as we stand here, we are going to drill roughly, we've got three drilling rigs running. Uh, we plan on drilling 24 horizontal wells, about 65 vertical wells. We don't see that cadence changing for the next year or two, as, as long as we can keep this export market going. Uh, we, uh, we, we're continuing to grow our production. Uh, we see our workforce uh, as a potential generational one. Uh, one of the messages that Jim Finley asked me to give you guys is that our success, these guys' success in the basin is gonna, should lift all ships. Should, should, this basin should be a, uh, an economic, uh, it should experience an uh, economic boom for the next 20 years. I, there, there's that much drilling inventory. Um, we're going to need people. We're, we're going to need uh, 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 capital to do it. But I think the key, the key to getting capital, the key to getting people, is eliminate this up and down that's happened over all the years. Every time we bump up against Salt Lake City capacity, we got to shut down. So if... If, if, for, if for any reason we couldn't rail wax out anymore, we'd have to shut in a significant amount of production, and it would take two years. It would take two years for our production decline to catch up with Salt Lake City's Salt Lake City's uh, 85,000 barrel a day capacity. We got to keep drilling, and we got to keep moving wax to the Gulf Coast. Here's the activity in the basin. We've got 12 drilling rigs, nine horizontal, three vertical. Code is out there drilling gas wells, having a lot of success. Um, the other operators in this room are, are drilling around the basin, uh, and, and I, I get to see probably more results than a lot because we, we have interest in a lot of wells, and everybody's making good wells. Production looks really good. We've got probably our five or six best wells we've drilled on right now, and they're, they're, they're looking awfully impressive. So, so we're excited. These, are, these wells would be impressive in any basin in, in the country. The cool thing about this basin, our water oil ratio typically is one to one, maybe one and a half to one. The Permian is four to five to one. So we don't have the water disposal issues the other basins have. And, and we see that on the vertical production also. Most of our water oil ratios are one to one. So we don't have to worry about injection issues that the, perm, the Permian is going to run into a wall, guys, I'm going to tell you. They were going to run into a wall. Uh, this is the most important chart you'll see today. I saw the estimates earlier for production. Well, we brought another 6,000 barrels on since April. So, so that number is going up, and I know a lot of other people in this room have brought some more production on. So it's exciting. This is, this is cu current estimated production is about 115,000 barrels a day. Um, in my history in the basin, that's a, t that's a high. That, that's a high. Uh, refining capacity is the red line here. These are projections we've made based on what we know about other companies' rig cadence. It, it, we, we can adjust it. Uh, we, we use a, a type curve for each area. We use a type curve for each operator, and, and it, so it varies. Right now, this, is, this cadence here is about six rigs. Right now, we've got nine rigs running. But this cadence is for about six rigs. Uh, it's going to take... Um, this is our vertical black wax production for the most part. We get a little bit of growth there, but we're, it's, it's going to take a rig working all the time between us and really Barry and, and, um, and Scout to, to keep that black wax flat. The yellow wax is where most of the growth is going to be. And uh, most of that, a lot of that's going to go outside the basin. Um, we are, we are in three years, we expect the basin to be at 170,000 barrels a day based on this rig cadence. We'll be exporting about 90,000 barrels a day. We're, we're railing, the basin's railing 30,000 barrels a day right now out of the basin between us and Price River. So, uh, uh, and that, that, that's kind of a guess on our part, but we, we think it's a pretty good guess. So we are railing already. Um, Exxon loves 
this wax, uh, they want 100,000 barrels a day. Just from us, just from the basin, from you guys, all of us. Uh, Motiva wants a bunch of it, the Saudi Arabian refinery. We're, <laughs> we, 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 we've, we're, we're no longer the black sheep of the oil industry. Refineries all over this country desire this wax because when I tell you it's a world-class product, it is a world-class product. You guys are sitting on a jewel of a resource. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's something that Jim Finley has been trying to tell people for seven or eight years, and finally it's coming to fruition. And, and Jim, I, I know he's my boss. He's not here. I'm not sucking up. He deserves a lot of credit because y'all don't have a clue how hard that man works for this basin. And y'all, his, his, what drives him, what drives him is not the financial gain. What drives him is to see this basin grow. He really, he, he wants everybody to be successful because it lifts all ships. It's good for the tribe, our tribal partners who, who, who are, who, we couldn't do this without them. Uh, it, it's, it's good for the local economy. It's good for the people here. This, this basin is full of great people. It, 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 it is the best place I've ever worked. Uh, I, and I've been in a lot of basins. I've been doing this for 42 years. And uh, I, I've, I've never been in a basin that has this much talent, hardworking, but also people willing to work together. If it's the Utah way, I like it, if that's what it's called. But I like it. So important to note, we're going to need 200 more crew trucks 400 more drivers and 3,000 more rail cars. We're working on the rail cars. We're, 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 we're getting them. But uh, we, we're going to need a lot of people. So, um, Reed, we might need your welding. What do you do at night? <laughs> what do you do at night? I mean, we, <laughs> we're, we're short people. For, <laughs> and, and, I got kids I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got a CDL, too, so you can drive. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so it's, 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 uh, you, I hope you guys uh, look at this real hard. I, I think it's conservative. I think the number's going to be bigger than that. So uh, we're going to expand Wildcat to 60,000 barrels a day. We hope to get that done by the first quarter. Uh, uh, Price River is not at capacity yet, we don't think. Um, so th they've got room. Uh, and we're going to continue trying to grow the rail capacity. That, 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 we, we. We're railing now. We have to rail now because if we don't rail now, we're shut in. We're shut down. We've got to go back to 80,000 barrels a day. So, needed improvements. Highway 191 is, is, is an issue. It, it's, 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 you guys know more than I do what an issue it is. So, we've, we've, we're working with the state and, 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 and different members in the government and also local people. Senator Winterton has been a a great advocate of this project, but there's work to be done on the highway. We need better turnout lanes. We need, we need some investment here. These, this, um, these investments will come back uh, in, in just uh, spades for us all. So needs to happen. Um, the bright future, demand for this wax is significant. I'm gonna say it time and time again. There's no better hydrocarbon on this planet. It's a transition material. This this will be here when we're almost all electric. They will need our wax because of the products it produces. Makeup on some of the people's faces here comes from our wax. Uh, you ever use chapstick? Comes from our wax. So uh, the uh, the thermostat in your car is run, run off our wax. It, it, it is a it is a unique unique product and won't get into the, the into the thermodynamics of it, but it's got a lot of green applications on the insulation side. And so anyway, it's exciting. It's exciting. And everybody in this room and your children and maybe your grandchildren should benefit from it. So oh, let me go back real quick. One more thing. The community, the banks, when they see that we're going to have a stable production environment, a stable market to go to, then we're going to need more stores, we're going to need more hotels, we're going to need more restaurants, and we're going to need more people, and the banks in the community are going to be able to lend money because this economy is going to be growing. It's going to be exploding. So 
anyway, it's, it's, it's a good thing for all of us. And, and I think that uh, we're excited to be a part of it. And, and we're excited that we've, we've gotten to the point we are now. And we just see a lot of future ahead of us. A lot of work to do, too, guys. Just a lot of work. And then y'all's efforts, that they're all so appreciated. UPA, where's Ricky? Here's Ricky. Thank you. Thank you. We wouldn't be here without you guys. Emissions-wise, we're working really hard there. We really are. We, 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 we are totally appreciative of the situation. We have a team now that's all they do. We, I think we have taken 2,200 Eldars internally looking for leaks. And, and you, we don't want to go to non-attainment either. But if we do, we're, we're gonna, we'll follow the rules. We'll do exactly what we need to do to, to, to meet emission guidelines. And uh, we, we, we started a program called Latch the Hatch. One of the biggest emission sources in the basin is thief hatches. You know, the, the, they get up there, they gauge the tank, they haul the oil off, and they forget to close the leak, the, 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 the hatch. So we've got signs everywhere. Uh, I know in our organization, that particular sin has been almost eliminated. We, we can't control the truck drivers all the time, but we follow back behind them looking for, looking for problems. Um, we, we, it, it's, it's, it's been, it is and con will continue to be one of our most important uh, investments. It just will be. And, and we, we know change is coming, and, and we're ready for it. Uh, so um, uh, any questions at all? We'll, we'll let the next go, and then we'll have yep. questions. Yep, perfect. Do I, do I need that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Well, that'd be fun. There you go. All right. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Jason Ashman. Chief Operating Officer for Javelin Energy, uh, and what a co what a comparison of two perspectives of uh, of the basin. You have 14 years, and you have 104 days. <laughs> yeah, so we are the new kid. On, we are the new group on the block, and we have no less excitement, no less excitement than than uh, Brett just shared. And so, like Brett, I'm an engineer. Uh, unlike Brett, I am not a Cajun. However, I live next to Cajuns, and I know the energy level they have, and I went, oh, Lord, I've got to follow a Cajun with all that energy. How am I going to compete? And then I remember, no, 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 this meeting's not about competing. It's about collaboration, amen? Amen. amen. Okay, so we're super happy to be here. When we put our presentation together, we put this first slide together and went, uh, uh, something's wrong here, guys. We got the wrong area of the world. So we've got to get some drones out and get some pictures so we can update our slides. So sorry, y'all don't have those, that, that many trees, and there certainly aren't any mountains in that picture. So apologize for that greatly. We'll get it corrected for the next time you see from us, but uh, we'll, we'll go moving forward. So uh, again, my name is Jason Ashman, Chief Operating Officer. I'm an engineer by trade. I've been leading teams for the last 15 years, so I really think that makes me a psychologist now. Um, but don't come up to me, I already have plenty of clients. So uh, let's keep moving forward. And I don't have my glasses on, so we hope that goes the right way. So this is our organization. You can go to our website and see these folks. John Jacoby is our CEO. John Jacoby's been doing this for 41 years. Uh, he and Jim actually have known each other for years and years and years. And so collaboration actually is already starting to occur through the friendship and the colleagueship that those two guys have had. John has done this for 41 years. What you need to know about John, uh, because the values that John holds are the ones we hold near and dear to our hearts. It's, it's how we run our organization. John has been wrenching rods since he was 12, so he didn't quite meet you uh, <laughs> for the 10-year-old start. Um, so uh, uh, as we think through it, John's been in the oil and gas business. He has started many organizations. He knows how to build value, and he knows how to treat the world responsibly. And you know why he treats the world responsibly? Is because he is a rancher. He is a landowner, and he is an environmentalist by heart and by nature. He says it's just the right way to do things, and I agree with him. There is no reason to have rules when you can just do the right thing all the time. And so that's the mantra that comes from John. And if you see him, he's six foot five, played tackles for the Philadelphia Eagles. You will, you will recognize John, and he has a very slow East Texas draw. So I hope you get to meet John someday. So John's our leader. You'll see our team with a lot of experience in a lot of different basins, 
in a lot of different areas of the world in every discipline that we've got. And so our team is very, very dynamic. But I do have a couple people here that, that you may want to meet. Uh, and, and one is Jack Van, Div Van Deventer. Uh, he is our VP of land. So for those folks, he heads up our land group. You sure need to make sure you meet him. And then uh, where's Scott Bliss? Scott Bliss is our community liaison. He is up here all the time, a person of great contact that, to deal with local agencies and the tribe and, and the refiners and all the marketers. So two people that we wanted to make sure you meet today. They've got their teams here. They are very easy to get a hold of. But to be fair, you can call me at any time. You can call John at any time. All we ask is that you leave a message because with the number of road calls that come in, we don't always pick up our phone when it's just a number. But we will absolutely call you back in a heartbeat. So that's our organization. Uh, this group is extremely excited. Hopefully, you'll get to meet a number of them as we go forward in, uh, in, in our history here. All right, so Javelin Energy. Uh, we, we are so happy to have this asset. We were the loser in the first round of bids. It backed up into us. We were very excited to get it. So for a period of about six weeks, we worked extremely hard to get this evaluated. I think we slept twice and, uh, and we were able to get it done. So we're, we closed on it in April or March 28th to be fair. And ultimately uh, now we're here. Javelin is a private organization. We are KKR backed um, and we are actually a subsidiary of Crescent Energy. Crescent Energy is a public holding company. They are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. The best way to describe this relationship would be like Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is a corporate shell that owns a lot of organizations and all these other organizations are private that live underneath them. That's how ours operates. We have two other sister companies that are private under that Crescent moniker. Uh, that is Contango, who really deals in PDP only, or long life assets, mature assets, and then Crescent Minerals doing non-op and mineral interest. Those three organizations are funded by an, uh, a public entity that is extremely excited to be in the business. And so when you hear long term, and you should hear long term over and over again out of my mouth and what you heard from, from Brett, is that we intend to be here long term. And that's why we we're really excited to be in this basin uh, uh, as we see it. So our company in general, if you go back six months ago, we had zero assets. Now we have three assets in three different basins. Uh, we have nearly 4,000 wells that we operate across these three different basins. We are here with 145,000 acres, currently running two rigs, and making about 24,000 barrels a day with potentially a new record this month. So as you said, we're at people adding production, we're adding quite a bit of production right now, and we see some real opportunity going forward for some of the changes we've made in designs and expect that outcome to be very positive. In addition to that, we have assets in the Eagleford, a, a similar footprint, we run, we run about one rig there, make about 16,000 barrels of oil a day. And then we have assets just in south of Fort Worth in the Barnett, uh, and then Barnett gas field making about 150 million cubic feet a day. So lots of interest, lots of wells. Uh, so we have a lot of places to deploy capital, but we see a lot of opportunity to deploy capital here. Now, to speak to some of the issues that you mentioned, we've got to be able to sell our oil, we've got to be able to sell our gas, and that's critical and paramount to us, and so we need to figure that out, and glad we have a lot of people here interested in doing that. So that's our company and where we operate. To tell you a little bit about our strategy, and you see the term long-term, we are long-term investors. We are not something that's going to build and flip. We are going to build and produce and monetize and be great actors in the area for a long period of time. And that's what you should hear about this asset because this asset has a significant amount of running room. And we're only touching the surface. I'm telling you guys, it is a world-class oil and gas kitchen with a lot of rock to store it. And so we have an opportunity to drill multiple horizons, not just the ones we're drilling today. In addition to that, we create sustainable industries. We are a valuable member to our community, we're valuable members to our employees, and we're valuable members to our investors. And we think of all those constituents in each and every day when we go out in the field. So how do we do that? We live those core values that I mentioned. Uh, we will protect our people. Our people live in the community. Uh, we will protect the environment in which they live in and all, their, and all their friends and family that live around it. It is first and foremost, if we cannot do that, we don't get to stay. And that is a heartfelt sentiment by me, it's heartfelt sentiment by John, and it's one that we push across our teams and it is the first thing we talk about each and every day. And we are dealing, if you know, we are dealing with some issues that, uh, that were part of our acquisition. 
uh, with the EPA, and we're happily uh, abiding by those and doing very well at those. And Eldar, like you, we've got quite a few Eldars in our, in our quiver as well. But the real answer is let's do the right thing. And we will do the right thing. And we think all the things they're asking us to do are the right things to do. And so we'll get it right and, uh, and continue to move forward. With our people and environment in place, we can now really focus on our investments. We will strategically think about the, the best way to make a dollar. Because don't forget, we are in this business to make dollars. And when we make dollars, we create jobs. And when we create jobs, we create opportunity. And that's really important. But if we don't make money, that's a problem. And everybody knows that's, a, that's what business is about. So we will effectively invest. We will communicate widely within our organization and with you as our, our, as our partners and our competitors, if you will, and the community. But ultimately, we're all in this together about continuous improvement. And when we do all those things right, we'll deliver outcomes that make sense to, the, to our organization and to the basin. And we believe the basin should be here for a long time. So last and, lastly, we commit to ESG each and every day, as I mentioned. All of these things are the things that our teams th talk about and hopefully you're talking about and challenging each other. So if we do this right, there won't be challenges in the basin from agencies that don't need to be here because we're going to do it right and we're going to do it for a long period of time. So with that, super excited to be here visiting with you all today, super excited to share our company with you. Look forward to dealing with you for a long, long future. So thank you. Good morning. My name is Matt Kovic. I'm the Uinta Basin Production Manager for Oventive. I've been working with Oventive uh, in Legacy Newfield now for about 17 years. I uh, apologize, no slide deck today. I've done a bunch of business development, corporate development, reservoir engineering work. So now that I'm wearing my production engineering hat, I kind of have an anti-PowerPoint uh, vibe because I've done, I've done enough slides now in my career. So I apologize for that. So you'll just have to stare at me and, and the logo on my shirt. But with that, um, I uh, appreciate you guys kicking it off. Uh, I'll bring up the rear here. Oventive, uh, a, a lot of folks I think know in the room, we were previously known as Newfield out here in the basin. We're approaching 20 years of presence out here. Uh, we acquired Inland Resources back in 2004 and then slowly have expanded the footprint. Um, it's, it's amazing, now I joined in 05, so I've only been in industry uh, 17 years. My, my background's aerospace engineering. So I came out of, the, uh, of NASA and the space program coming over to Newfield and going around the company to start learning about the assets uh, to help with the corporate budget process. And I remember sitting in a conference room in, in Newfield's Denver office back in late 05. And I remember, we don't have a map up, but a map of the basin. One of our geologists, Dan Shoemake, who joked that he was here when oil was deposited, um, said he stared at that map and he was adamant. He had a map on the wall and he was banging on the wall. And he was like, uh, Anything north of the dome, north of the GMBU, it's the line of death. Nothing good is north of that. It's the line of death because vertical mindset, vertical drilling, water flood mindset, right? So sitting there, and I just remember that to this day because now, you know, fast forward 17 years and everything you guys have spoke about, about this basin and the technology and the advancement the industry has made everywhere, but particularly here in the Uinta Basin, now you look and very, very exciting results everywhere north of the line of pain as he referred to it. So only set, I have not been anywhere near what you guys had said, but 17 years and that drastic acceleration in technology and development is leading to some very exciting things out here in the basin, uh, setting production records. Um, Oventive is, as folks may or may not know, exploration production company, uh, multi-basin approach. We have assets up in the Monty Shale in Canada, North Dakota in the Bakken, Anadarko Basin in Oklahoma, and then the Permian in Texas. Uh, and then the Uinta Basin, obviously. Uh, a little flip-flop, we run kind of the Rocky assets out of the Woodlands, Texas office where I'm based, and we run our Permian assets out of our Denver office. So makes a lot of sense. That's kind of a legacy from the, uh, the merger between Newfield and in Canna. So that occurred uh, November of 18, and Canna announced the merger with Newfield. And then in 2020, 
they moved their corporate headquarters from Calgary, Canada to Denver, Colorado, and at that time took the opportunity to rebrand the entire company to Oventive to kind of help blend the legacy in Canada, legacy Newfield, under one brand, under one logo. So I know there's been confusion out here in terms of the, the number of name changes, but out here it was Newfield uh, rebranded Oventive with a lot of the great Newfield folks still here today. Um, 209,000 acres currently, including federal fees, state, and tribal. And like these guys have said, just really good wells going on. Uh, we just set uh, a record oil production, operated oil production of 40,000 barrels a day, just as Oventive uh, running one rig. So that kind of tells you, again, the advancement technology in the wells we and the others in the room are drilling. Um, just really, really good performance and exciting about all the multi-stack multi, multi -stack payout here. Immediate plans in the basin, we're currently running one rig, drilling a four-well pad. We'll frack and complete that. And the team now has already turned to 2023. What's happening in 23, planning for that. There's a lot of things like we talked about this morning, whether it's gas takeaway, water takeaway, sourcing water, um, oil marketing. Work through those, that, those puzzle pieces to put our 23 program together. But we're really excited about it, and we're already... In July, which seems uh, early for us because our budgeting is normally August, September, but we're already laser focused on putting together our 2023 drill program. Uh, let's see. Outlook for the future. Obviously, uh, everybody knows our recent announcement on July 6th to sell the Greater Monument Butte unit, our water flood unit, um, to a capable buyer that will come in and I think put a laser focus down there and, and develop that asset. For us, it was... Um, a focus on our core competencies. We're a multi-basin horizontal uh, drilling company. We've learned a ton in the Permian. We put all of that knowledge to work in the Anadarko Basin in Oklahoma and having incredible results there. And now the focus is taking all that institutional knowledge and learning about multi-stack pay horizontal development and, and putting it here and putting it to work in the Uinta Basin. Um, and so that's our focus. Sale has no impact to our capital plans. It does include a little over 85,000 net acres, uh, south, all south of the dome, and about 1,000 producing wells and, and 250 injection wells. So uh, more to come on that, but uh, I just wanted to talk through that because I know that was some recent news here announced by us uh, a couple weeks ago, or last week, I guess. So with that, I'd, I'd echo, again, no slides to kind of wrap up, but I would echo, echo the, assignment, the excitement here that these two spoke of. Being here almost 20 years as a company, uh, we've had a, you know, established a connection here within the community with our local and state officials, with the Ute tribe, to really responsibly develop this asset. Uh, I'd say from a mission standpoint, because it's front and center a lot now, especially with the basin and how close we are to non-attainment, um, we have actually corporately directly tied employee compensation to GHG emission reduction all the way from... Don and I, all the way up to, to Brendan McCracken, our CEO, our compensation is tied to really focusing in on emissions, reducing them across our company uh, to responsibly develop the assets that we have. So with that, I appreciate you guys having us here. Appreciate everything the folks do in this basin and in the state for this industry. Let's continue to fight for our industry and the pressures we see from all angles. Uh, you know, from the outside communities that don't really understand truly the good people that are in this industry and the value that we generate. So with that, I'll conclude. So my name is Gordon Moon. I'm on the oil, gas, and mining board. Um, I actually run cows uh, south of that line of pain, you call it, <laughs> and I was actually pretty happy they stopped drilling down there because every well pad was taking five acres of grass from, from my, my cattle. Um, but uh, I'm glad they went, they went north and all the good production that's happened with horizontal drilling. Uh, I represent uh, oil, uh, surface and mineral rights. I, I'm one of seven seats on, I sit in one of seven seats on the Board of Oil, Gas and Mining and I've thoroughly enjoyed being on that board. Uh, the division, I first got to know them. Uh, when I first started learning about our family's mineral rights, um, I was out on some private ground and there was a well and I learned that we had mineral rights just 400 feet from this well. And I'm like, well that well's gotta be draining a bigger area. So I, I, my first contact with the, with the division was Brad Hill, was the permitting manager uh, many years ago, not that many years ago, but anyway, he explained setbacks to me 
it was fascinating to me how it all worked. Um, and then a few years after that, I got, uh, was able to join the board and, and I've enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed uh, seeing the operators come in and present their cases for spacing requests or pooling orders. And it's been just fun to get to know them and, and to try to figure out how on earth they drill a foot, uh, a mile and a half in the, down in the ground and then turn that drill bit and go two miles and then frack it and complete it. And it's, it's just amazing um, what you guys do. Uh, to kick this off, I'll just ask a question or two, and then we'll open it up to the to the rest of you to an, uh, to a ask questions. How long do we have? Will you just tell us? Okay, okay. So to to start off with, we've heard about a lot of constraints today. That's kind of been the the word that we've heard a lot. Uh, in each of yours minds, what's what's your biggest worry, your biggest constraint, and and what are you doing to to resolve it? So, uh, oh, are, we, are we live? There we go. Okay, so, so we're obviously new in the basin, and we're still trying to get our head around a lot of things. Um, but it's very clear that the things that have been discussed today in multiple presentations, and in, in, in each of these three presentations, is we've got to get our product to market. And there are two, there are two phases that we've got to deal with, and both oil and gas are important. And getting, because you can't solve one without the other. And even as we sit today, gas constraints are causing oil constraints. And so we've got to figure out a way to, to solve that problem and solve it together in a very thoughtful and responsible way. And then I, I'll add one more, only because all three of us have said it, people. We need people. And to, need, to get people here, we need infrastructure and, and, and all the things that support said people. Watching other basins go through wicked growth, which is not what I'm suggesting that we have here, but watching other basins go through that pain of man camps and all of that space, which is unpleasant, uncomfortable, we need to find a methodical and even kill solution that will get us people to be here for the 20 years that we're all talking about. So. Yeah, I would echo that in terms of the gas side. Um, you know, through all a lot of the great work that you spoke of, of, of Mr. Finley and, and the industry of getting rail and oil, it seems like if you think of the products on a maturity curve, oil's probably farther along than the gas side in terms of collaboration across the industry to find a solution. Um, so I think the oil's headed in the right direction. Uh, but I do think now gas and whether it probably doesn't need to be as formal as like the railroad coalition, but some sort of industry coalition uh, with the U tribe and our industry and state and local officials and, and the pipeline companies to come up with a very organized approach to the gas takeaway uh, bottlenecks that, that Reed highlighted. Um, that to me, like you said, it's going to constrain oil. Uh, gas prices are great. Oil prices are great. But uh, right now you could run easily run into situations where the gas is going to constrain the oil production. So a collaborative effort there is going to be key. The other for me, uh, thinking through the last of the three products, but water, we do have relatively low water oil ratios, but still how to sustainably and responsibly dispose of the water, especially with the people constraints and the water truck uh, constraints we've all dealt with over the last nine to 12 months, bringing really great wells on and, and having to hold them back a bit because of, of lack of water trucks in certain areas. So that, but then also the fresh water sourcing as well and, and reuse. Can we, can we get creative ways to reuse our pretty fresh water? We're blessed with pretty fresh water here as well. So is there, are there ways to responsibly reuse, produce water uh, in our frack operas and stuff like that to then pull less on the fresh water sources in the basin? So those are kind of front and center in terms of you know, longer term planning out here. I, I concur on, on everything they've said. That, that, that that's all real, real important. Uh, I, I, I think that the, the, the other issue, I guess the other issue that's, that's, that's back there is just, we, we need, we don't just need workers, we need skilled workers. Where we're having the big shortage right now is just on the construction side. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but you know we we've got several wells right now that we've drilled that we're we're waiting to put on production because we don't have crews, and we've got all the tribal uh, uh, construction companies uh, book booked up and busy, and and what's happening is that uh, uh, <laughs> companies are robbing each other uh, of of construction um, uh, talent. So uh, that's a tough deal right now, and that uh, we're um, every day is a different story. So we bring bring in some more 
uh, construction um, uh, talent into the basin, I think is real important. And I, and I would suggest that maybe with if, if the housing looks like it's going to slow down and in and, and the Salt Lake City area and some of the other communities uh, west of here, may, maybe it's time we start posting some job postings um, in some different areas and try to bring some some talent, some 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 uh, talented construction workers into the basin. I think right now the basin's just feel, feeling growing pains, and I, I agree. We don't want to see man camps. That's that's not our that's not our goal. And I think I think that uh, one of the blessings in this basin is that m most of y'all stay here. No, no, y'all y'all are born and raised here, which is great. So we have a great uh, uh, employee group. We just need more. And so we'd like to get more Utah talent in here, right? Yeah, so anyway. Thank you, thank you. Matt, you mentioned uh, with the railroad, we have the seven county infrastructure that got this going. With gas, who's going to do that? Who's going to get get that? This is yours. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, as the longer Reed's presentation went on, the more worried I, I became. So who's going to? It's a good question. Maybe Reed can answer it. He's scheduling gas. Yeah. <laughs> He's scheduling around the bottlenecks. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. But I, I think just a, a concerted effort, organized effort, so that everybody doesn't scramble to go accomp do their own thing, and it, it's more inefficient at costs or um, from a surface standpoint, getting a lot of different pipes approved with different right-of-ways. Can we, can we not organize uh, that way? So. I agree with that. We've looking, we're have we looking at several things right now that, that we're working on, and uh, it's uh, uh, having the tribe as a partner is, is, is very important because they've got a lot invested here also. And so uh, work, working with the Ute tribe and, and, and look, exploring some, uh, some different options. I, I, think, I think we're going to come up with some solutions that, that have some very, very long-term uh, consequences, and I think some of the stuff we mentioned have to get done. But, but I, th I think I think it's a it's not as big a hurdle as the rail. I think it's something we can accomplish. So. Okay, Reed's nodding his head. He liked that answer. So. <laughs> that's a that's a yeah. twin. <laughs> oh. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> so my next question is about responsible development. So on the oil, gas, and mining board, we're always you know looking at your presentations about. This is the best way to develop a field and do it to do it responsibly, looking out for the long term, not just short term production. How how are your companies doing your best to, to accomplish that? So so one of the things that Finley has done is that we've moved from single well pads. Uh, almost all our we're, we're we're more of a vertical drilling company. Uh, our partner Uena Wax handles our uh, horizontal program, and they're they're very good at it. Uh, so r right now we, we just developed a, 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 sec a couple of sections down south of the le south of the river at Willow Creek, and all of it was pad drilling. So we had probably a third to a quarter of the locations you would normally have uh, in, in a development like that. So um, uh, you, using pad drillings, and, and it's, it gets difficult at some of the shallower depths to meet, meet all your targets at the right spacing and everything, but it's something our engineers have worked real hard on and, and our geologists have worked real hard on, and so we, we don't even think about drill, drilling single well pads anymore. We, we're looking at multiple well pads to try to keep our footprint as small as possible because, again, a lot of our surface is tribal, and we want to we preserve as much as that acreage as we can. Yeah, and I would echo that. Multi-well pads are the way to go. We've learned it from all the other basins that we've dealt with. I think what is intriguing is as we continue to do vertical delineation and we start seeing additional zones work for us, which we believe that will be the case, that we can reutilize some of the equipment that we've already got and commingle some of that as well. So we can get more oil and gas out of the ground without adding any more surface equipment, without adding any more surface, uh, uh, disturbing any more surface. But to Matt's point, I think this water, being responsible with water, not just of disposal, but how we source it is extremely important. Uh, uh, as an area that has, has less rainfall than some other parts of the world, we need to make sure that we're very responsible in that. And so I, I, I applaud that effort, and we're fully, we're fully behind and collaborative with you, is that? 
Yeah, I agree. The multi-well pads, one of the things Oventive has learned, like I mentioned, in the Permian Basin, and we put it to use in the Anadarko Basin to shrink the footprint but also cut facility costs and be responsible from a surface footprint was the multi-well pads and the cube development. We have an eight-well eight cube on and a six-well cube on. We have plans for more. So um, really looking at that. The other thing we've looked at and learned elsewhere is you may still have a single well here and there to hold some acreage. How do you optimally design that pad so you can come reoccupy it and minimize the second surface disturbance or the third and, and not have to keep back keep coming back to the same landowners to disturb whether it's access or surface or whatever so managing through that uh, the other thing i'd say from a responsible development standpoint top front and center for oventive is safety and and we really push that from day one. Everything we talk to, whether it's uh, any discussion we have internally, whether it's ELT reviews uh, with the leadership team, our safety stats are front and center. We want to make sure everybody, whether it's Oventive or any contractor, or any employee that are on our on our pads, go home in the same condition they arrive, so they can go home to their family, earn a good wage, go home to the family, and enjoy the kids and grandkids or whatever it may be. So we really stress that that anything we do. We have to do it safely. If we have to stop an operation to make sure we make it safe before we do it, we do it. And we've we've had that pushed out through all the organization and is fully supported. And I think lastly, the emissions piece, I think how to responsibly develop a lot of work. And I think one of the things we may get there in the panel later, but is incremental power into the basin, electrification. I think that's a big push to responsibly develop the basin as well, given the air quality concerns that we have so that we can electrify our artificial lift and electrify our pad sites uh, and bring incremental power to then, again, responsibly develop the multi-well pads that we're thinking of. Yeah, Matt and I were talking earlier about, because uh, Moon Lake right now, it's all coal fired. They have a little bit of hydro, but they're actually decommissioning some of that. and. There's not a lot of plans right now to transition to natural gas, and that's something that that needs to be done. Uh, the, the, our board went and visited XCL's EFRAC uh, a month or so ago. <clears throat> they're natural gas fired. They're powering their frac with natural gas. Actually, just half of it right now. They've got the other half, I think, coming. Um, but I mean, that's great. Use our natural gas right here that we can't get rid of to, to power fracks. Um, and I asked, why can't you, because while we were there touring, um, they weren't using the power. They weren't able to frack right then. They had a transition happening. And so well, we're able to take this power and put it on the grid. And they said they can't because Moon Lake doesn't need it right then. Uh, electricity has to be consistent, you know, exactly the amount that you need when you need it. And, and they just don't have, you know, what they're doing is not consistent. So they've got to have just ways of, uh, of doing that. XCL was, I feel bad they're not here. They could brag about their EFRAC because um, it's a pretty neat process that they're doing up there. But um, okay, uh, let's take any questions from anyone in the audience. John. So great presentations by all of you. I really appreciate you being here. I think the world has gained a stark realization of supply chain issues. So can you share with us what specific supply chain issues you're facing as companies? I think for us, uh, nothing comes to mind where we're not able to operate without the stuff being there when we need it uh, from a supply chain. I, I there just know inflation's happening. I know we're all battling that. Uh, tubulars are skyrocketing um, the cost of goods is, is going way up um, and so that's something we're trying to offset with efficiencies and how we're designing facilities and how we're how we're doing things to try to offset as much as the inflation as we see but yeah and i think it is a it is a uh, connection right with the the demand on tubulars steel across the world and the supply chain disruptions it's impacting us at least day to day with the cost of the goods the cost of of, uh, of the things we're using to build our pad sites and put down the well bores. Yeah, I would echo the same. So being in three basins, we're seeing uh, much higher much higher issues with that competition for services and goods in the Eagleford as it relates to the Permian, uh, as that competition. When we move up to Utah, we are fortunate, and I think we should all be, feel blessed about that. We're a little more fortunate that we're not competing for services from some other basins that are immediately adjacent. So we should take advantage of that 
and and continue to grow. But the cost of goods is is rough. Uh, and and the thing that we all have to be very mindful of is what the industry has done for years and years, which is chase the price. And then ultimately it flips and everybody loses money on the backside. That is not a successful, that is what shuts basins down. And we don't want that. So we're gonna be very mindful, we're gonna be very methodical, but we're gonna be very even keel as we go forward. The supply chain bites in a lot of ways. Um, I think we've got a mud pump that's been down three days on the Aztec rig. Uh, so we have a mud pump waiting on a part. I mean, we, we got a crew standing by, we, we're, we've got a bit on bottom, we can't drill, we're waiting on a pump part. Uh, what's happening, uh, these, these rigs have been, uh, been run hard because other rigs were shut down. Uh, the pumps on this rig need to be completely gone through. But they, the, 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 the drilling companies have, have uh, because they were, they were hit head on by a tra freight train with COVID, they stopped investing in spare parts and, and they rob parts from other rigs. And so, uh, uh, and we're not in the Permian where they can go steal it off another rig. They've got one rig here. And so, uh, so we're seeing some of that. Uh, we, um, we've had to shut in facilities because we couldn't get a, a certain device, electrical device uh, that, that needs to be at that facility for maybe our, our uh, automatic equipment. Uh, and sometimes that's a couple of days, sometimes it's a couple of weeks to get one part that used to be available like that. So, so yeah, there, there are issues in the supply chain still. The steel prices, we're, we're, we're trying to combat that by, by buying, trying to uh, be judicious in, in our purchases, but it's, it's tough. I, tubing has gone from anywhere from four to six dollars a, a foot. It's up uh, flirting with 15 and 16 dollars a foot. So it's, it's tripled. Uh, Cason, same thing. Same thing. We were paying about eleven fifty, twelve dollars for five and a half. Uh, we're up around twenty eight, I think twenty seven, twenty eight dollars now. So, so th those, the, it, it is it has a big impact on us, and and so it it uh, hopefully, hopefully the as the economy, I, I I think we're starting to catch up a little bit, but hopefully the economy uh, is able to compensate, and we'll start seeing steel prices come down. Very good. Uh, I'd like to also plug that the UPA Lunch and Learn. I watched the first one that I've ever watched, and it was really good. Uh, in that, the second uh, presenter, he has actually analyzed each of your companies and has said, basically said what your cost per barrel to produce is. I don't know how accurate he is, but he's taken all the data, and I don't know if you guys happen to, happen to see that. Um, anyway, get the link from Ricky. Uh, it, it was really good. I, he'd gone through the whole, you know, all of the all of the costs, and probably it was based on a year ago costs because he doesn't know your costs now. But but he had you each pegged at your cost per barrel, and and you're all pretty close. But but uh, I don't re I don't remember who was ahead. But anyway, uh, any other questions? Are we time? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Just one final thing. We did just receive word, late breaking news. The rod for the Forest Service permit was signed. That's pretty good. Pretty good timing for today. Well, I would like to thank everyone um, on this panel today and the insight you gave us. We really appreciate that, traveling a long ways up here. But, and also thank everyone else that participated, participated today. It uh, takes a lot to get these together, so we appreciate Duchesne County, the staff here at the Event Center. Um, Paul Gedge was running our tech back there, and he, he gets this out to the world. And so well, thank you to everyone, and thank you for you for your support. Our next meeting will be October 13th here. And so right now we'll break for lunch unless there's anything else you'd like to bring up. Oh, one question back here. I just want to make a quick comment. Okay. Um, I'll come up here. Sorry, I'm, I know I'm keeping everybody from lunch, but my name's Travis Campbell. I'm 
With you in a county, the Office of Economic Development, so I just wanted to make sure, while we've got everybody here to, to mention the 2022 Energy Summit, so if you haven't seen those emails, um, make sure to find me today and so I can get you on our email list. Uh, but the summit this year is going to be August 30th and 31st. So it's a Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, again, emails have gone out, but if you haven't seen those, get with me. I'll make sure you get on that email list. Registration is open. We've got five sponsorship levels available. Um, it's going to be a great summit. We'll have a, a lot of you know, industry updates. We'll have updates from our state officials, federal officials. We'll have topics on ESG, on EJA, and NEPA, and water quality, air quality. Um, it's going to be a good one, so, so make sure. Um, if you have any questions, come find me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.